and nobody's low on a drug. You, you know, I can bet you're all going to be low on some vitamins and minerals, but nobody's actually, no, nobody's actually low on a drug. When I was young, I never heard of anybody who had a problem with bread. Gluten intolerance didn't exist. But then they made bread differently then. You know, vitamin C is probably the biggest kept secret of the lot. Vitamin C is the one they really don't want you to know about because every vaccine essentially would be irrelevant uh, if people were taking enough vitamin C. Bubble ozone through water for a minute and completely neutralize all the chemicals in it with the exception of fluoride. So silver is a very important trace element. If you're low on silver, you'll get infections. You know, the ancient Greeks knew all about silver. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming. Um, just before I start, I need to make uh, something clear from a legal perspective. Uh, I'd like you to understand that tonight uh, is stand-up comedy, and anything that I may say is purely uh, in humour and irony. And um, if I accidentally use a word that's contentious, uh, like cancer or cure or anything like that, I'm spelling them with a K, and it has nothing to do. So, so I, you know, I'm not trained in medicine, uh, although my background is ophthalmic optics. Um, so uh, all I explain is health. I'm not, uh, if I use uh, any medical uh, terminology again, I'm using it uh, spelt completely differently. Now, uh, is any, has anybody been sent here today by the authorities uh, in, or by the pharmaceutical industry? Can I just ask that question? No? Okay. So, um, uh, let's start with the most important stuff, okay? Uh, let's just have a very quick look at magnesium for those of you who don't know. Do you know what they do in the emergency room if somebody's having a heart attack? They inject you with magnesium, at some salts. Do you know what they do in the emergency room if somebody's having a stroke? They inject you with uh, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. What do they do in a birth emergency where the woman is, has got preeclampsia, they, they are sort of cramped up? Uh, they inject magnesium. Now, um, the emergency room doctors are the geniuses out there because their job is to save your life. That's what their job is. So they know all about magnesium. Magnesium is the mineral that de-stresses you. Magnesium saves lives, it really does. Uh, but they don't teach it to doctors. It's absurd. They teach it to the, the emergency room doctors, but they don't seem to teach it to the GPs because <clears throat> if they knew... You see, imagine they taught GPs about magnesium. Uh, things would be so different. The, the hospitals would be virtually empty. Virtually empty, because the thing about magnesium is that, as, as I mentioned, it will stop a heart attack in mid-heart attack. It'll stop a stroke in mid-stroke. Um, if people supplemented with magnesium, then where would the customers be? Where would the heart attacks be coming from? Well, they'd probably be coming from low vitamin D and low vitamin C. But magnesium would solve so many people's problems. Um, so, so let's look at the symptoms of magnesium deficiency. There'd be panic attacks, anxiety, muscle cramps, maybe in the legs, in, in the feet, menstrual cramps, constipation, uh, heart attacks and strokes. Um, there are a whole host of problems that are magnesium related. Now, uh, magnesium is one of the key components to make ATP, which is the uh, uh, ATP is made in the mitochondria, the sort of powerhouse of the cell, gives you energy. And so without enough magnesium, you can barely do anything. Uh, so could I ask you, how many of you have any of those symptoms, muscle cramps, any, any of that stuff? Yeah, okay. So just under half of you. Um, 
If you had a muscle cramp of your heart muscle, that would be called a heart attack. And so anybody who's, who is getting muscle cramps is a serious, serious warning, or whatever the symptoms are. Um, so what is causing, um, let's say, the, there's, there's an epidemic of bowel issues out there. You know, we're supposed to have a bowel issue, uh, a bowel movement after every meal. So that's, let's say, three a day. Um, a lot of people aren't getting one a day. I had a client uh, last week who hadn't had a bowel movement for two weeks. I mean, that's really, really dodgy. Anybody who hasn't, isn't having bowel movements every day, they've got to consider that they're in serious trouble health-wise. They're the ones who are at risk of all the bowel diseases, IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, whatever it is, uh, irritable bowel, and they're the ones who, who are at risk of the, uh, the cancers. Because uh, you imagine you took some, sorry about this, you took some feces out and you put them on your hand and you wrapped it up with cling film, left it there for half an hour, your, the skin's gonna get upset. Leave it there for half a day, a whole day. You know, so you know, those people who, you walk in, in the lavatory after they've been in there and the smell is so appalling, you, you've gotta run. Those are the people who are rotting inside. Those are the people who are going to get very, very ill. And the answer probably is probably just three things. They're probably low on magnesium because the thing about magnesium is that it allows the muscles to relax, whereas calcium, and everybody's pretty much has got too much calcium actually, calcium allow, uh, allows the muscles to contract. So let's say people with um, constipation their bowel is contracted um, with the, all the calcium and, and because they're low on magnesium, it won't let go because you know, a movement is, is, is like that, sort of pulsing movement, pushing everything through. So um, there used to be a phrase uh, called, it went through me like a dose of salts. So my grandparents, if they were constipated, they'd take Epsom salts, half a teaspoonful or a teaspoonful of Epsom salts and a glass of water and instantly it would go through them like a dose of salts, Epsom salts, and uh, they wouldn't have any bowel issues. So most people are dehydrated, which is one of the reasons they can't have a proper bowel movements, but lack of magnesium is rife. I would say 90% of the population are low on magnesium and just don't know it. And they've got a whole host of problems because of that. Now, uh, the best way to take magnesium, you can take capsules if they're pure, I don't like tablets generally because they're stuck together with glue usually. The capsules generally are better, but they can still put things like magnesium stearate and titanium dioxide and stuff in the capsules. And I don't recommend any capsules that have any additives whatsoever. The only reason they put this stuff in half the time is so that the stuff is slippery and it goes through the machines faster so they can run the machines faster. All they've got to do, generally speaking, is turn down the speed of the machines and they can run them without all these extra bits and pieces and you don't need magnesium stearate which is in almost every capsule out so how how do you, how can you tell whether the, your supplement company that you're buying stuff from is any good or not well it's a real issue because i would say 90 percent plus of all the natural health manufacturers out there have been taken over by the pharmaceutical industry or you know big food or big pharma so, you know, um, I think probably one of the famous makes in England is Solgar. Um, that's owned by the Carlyle Group, uh, and you know, they're the eventual owner. The Carlyle Group are uh, arms manufacturers, arms dealers. Hello, come in and uh, take a seat wherever, wherever you like. Um, so who owns Holland and Barrett? Carlyle Group. Who owns Puritan's Pride? Carlyle Group. Who owns GNC? Carlyle Group. So, you know, I mean, obviously, of course, we all trust arms dealers with our health. You know, that would be who you'd choose to shop with. So, you know, you've got to be careful who you buy your stuff from. And um, just because it was good last year doesn't mean it is going to be good next year. You know, they... Um, you know, what did the Chinese do in the old days? Well, in the old days, the family would pay their doctor when everybody was well. But if somebody got ill, granny got ill, then the whole family would stop paying the doctor until he got granny sorted out. Now there's an incentive to get people well. But the unfortunate fact appears to be that in most Western 
countries where the medicine is sort mm -hmm. of dictated by really the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, it's purported to be government, but really they're telling them what to do. Um, I mean, let me just give you an example of, uh, of this. You know, I mean, the doctors, um, the doctors are paid by how many ill people are on the books. The more ill people they're looking after, the more they get paid. So where's the incentive to get people better? It, it's, it doesn't appear to be there, as far as I can see. I'm happy to be corrected. But um, the, I believe that the doctors want to help and generally the medical schools only take them straight from school. They don't usually like taking people who've had a year out. And um, I did an interview with a Harvard educated uh, medical doctor, you know, the brightest of the bright, and I asked her what her experience was like at medical school because you know, she went in there wanting to help. And I think all doctors do, basically. They've got, got pure hearts and they want to help. But what happens is, I said to her, how long was it into your medical profession until you had to cover up for a big mistake that maybe cost a life or you know, where one of your junior doctor colleagues made a mistake? She said, right away, right away. And she said the first thing that struck her was that to get through the medical exams, they were so tough that you had to cheat. She said it wasn't possible to get through without cheating. And they were all cheating. All of the junior doctors were cheating on the exams and that they were compromised as a result. I mean, this is America, by the way, so things I'm sure are totally different here in England. But she said they were all compromised morally right at the start. And about two years in, she said, they dropped this bombshell. They said, you do realize that half of what we're teaching you is wrong. Now, when they first start at medical school, obviously, you know, everybody believes the doctors know what they're doing. You know, that, that's sort of a given. So when they suddenly find out they've now got a 50-50 chance of the drug they're handing out as a junior doctor is going to damage the person rather than help the person, they're in a bit of a mental dilemma. But I can't remember if it was the Lancet or the British Men Medical Journal. It used to be that they said 10% of the drugs actually do, did what they said, but they dropped that down to 9% of the drugs actually doing what, what they said, you know, being effective. So the, when they're told only 50% of what they're being told is right, that wasn't true anyway. Only about, only about 10% of what they're being told is actually sort of working in the field. So um, by the time they're discovering this stuff, their parents have probably already shelled out 100,000. And by the time they've got five years down the road, they're, you know, they're, they're in huge debt and their parents are probably in debt and they're pretty much stuck, but they're getting a great income. They're getting a very good income. And if they were to suddenly say, oh dear, I don't want to do this, I'm hurting more people than I'm helping, you know, they're going to be in financial trouble. And so they're sort of committed. Um, so what happens when they start going into practice and they're re realizing the drugs aren't working? Well, they're sort of forced to cut off a bit of compassion and empathy, I think, and deal with the fact that they, every 10 minutes they've got to see somebody, see somebody, and they're probably not getting better. But they don't know what they don't know. They haven't really been taught vitamins and minerals. They do maybe half a day on food and vitamins and minerals, so they don't really know. And then they've got the law. They've got NICE, you know, the NICE guidelines to follow. They're, they're told what they're allowed to do. And, I mean, you know, you go to a doctor, you've got to expect one of three things, basically. Drugs. And nobody's low on a drug. You, you know, I can bet you're all going to be low on some vitamins and minerals, but nobody's actually, no, nobody's actually low on a drug. So the drug is never the answer. It's a treatment at best. It's going to cover up some symptoms and may, maybe make it go away if it's an anti antibiotic. But you know, my main brush with health problems myself was caused by antibiotics. About 30 years ago, I was in my early 30s, and I was embarrassed because I had spots on my face. I was embarrassed about that, and I went to see the doctor, which really wasn't the most sensible thing to do. I should have gone and seen a dietitian who might have said to me, uh, stop eating two Mars bars a day and, you know, cut out the sandwiches and change one or two little things. But I didn't do that, and the doctor said, oh, I've got just the thing for you, new antibiotic, you'll love it. Anyway, um, not that long time later, I started developing arthritis so badly that I could no longer walk, and I couldn't drive, and then I had to give up working and I then, then I couldn't put, do up the buttons on my clothes and eventually I ended up in the 
hospital. I'd become type 1 diabetic because my pancreas had started packing up. They thought I got a tropical disease. I was falling to pieces, and they put me in the observation ward. Now, after three weeks in the observation ward, and they used to wake me up every two hours throughout the night to take blood to try and... Cause they couldn't... They, I mean, it was hopeless. After three weeks, they said, well, we don't know what's wrong with you. Don't know what's caused this. I found out years later there was antibiotics because when I started seeing clients and advising them about health, various other type 1 diabetics explained to me exactly the same thing had happened to them. They'd gone, got antibiotics, and suddenly they'd become type 1 diabetic and arthritic and so on. Anyway, after three weeks in the hospital, I figured it out because I, I could still read books, and I'd worked out which minerals and vitamins I was low on. And I actually got advice from Patrick Holford, who's now written about 40 health books, and he told me what to do. He told me which vitamins and minerals to take and what essential fats I needed and what amino acids I might be low on. And all the arthritis went away. And I looked like I was 90. I mean, I had knobbly, bony bits sticking out at every joint. It was horrendous to look at. And it all went away because I was low on magnesium. They, they were calcifications I'd got. I'd got calcifications, as we mentioned earlier. Calcium, essentially, you might say to some degree, is like the opposite of magnesium. And because we're all low on magnesium, we're in trouble. So, does magnesium cost a lot of money? No. It's ludicrously cheap stuff. Uh, were our ancestors low on magnesium? No. No, they weren't. Because things have changed. I mean, when I, you know, I'm now 62. When I was young, I never heard of anybody who had a problem with bread. Gluten intolerance didn't exist. But then they made bread differently then. Then, wheat was about you know, this sort of high, maybe. Now it's right down near the floor. They've hybridized it. But the main thing that you know, our ancestors, everybody around the world, when they baked bread, they'd let it rise, then they'd knock it back, then they'd let it rise again, knock it back, and generally they would, they'd call it proving bread. They'd prove it overnight. So it was well known that if you wanted to make healthy bread, uh, you, you, you had to uh, wait about eight hours for the process to happen. And in that process, you know, in, in grains, there, there's something called phytates. And the humans don't get along with phytates. And so to deal with that, they used, used to leaven the bread. And you know, then they stopped doing that. You know, modern bread, it says on the Hovis lorry, something like, as good as it's always been. Now, how does that get past advertising standards? Because in the old days, they'd really make bread, like I say, but now they, they, they use flour improver, which is often a bromine-based thing. And bromine isn't good for you. That's what they gave the soldiers in World War I to make them compliant so they'd go over the top without complaining and to stop them getting horny, which might have been a problem. Bromine was very good for that. And uh, you know, I can't say what the, the manufacturers use, but you know, Hovis, for example, used to say something like 100% pure whole wheat. Then they changed it to 100% uh, pure whole grain. Then they changed it to 100% British whole grain. And you know, I, I would have assumed, I think most of you do, that, that most breads are made of wheat. You, know, you might get rye bread or whatever, but most bread is wheat. You look at almost any packet of bread these days, it's usually 43% soya. There's wheat in there. Um, but the bread is so different, so everybody's having bread problems. I mean, it's rampant, you know, absolutely ridiculous. And then, of course, they're spraying the chemicals on it, you know, Monsanto's Roundup and so on. This isn't doing anybody any good at all, nor is it doing the soil any good. I was a, an organic farmer for nine years. And uh, the first year, uh, they came around and said, yeah, we, we're going to charge you money f because you're not putting chemicals on the soil. That was basically, you know, to begin an organic farm, you have to pay for a license to prove you're organic. And I said, well, surely you should be charging the people who are poisoning the, grant, the land rather than me who's doing it like we always did. But no. And I said, well, look, um, you know, I, I, I bought deliberately land that had never, ever had chemicals on it, ever. Right? It, it was old land. And I said, well, you know, imagine I had put chemicals on. How long would it take to, to, for those chemicals to be out of the soil? And say, so, well, in almost every case, we pass everybody in three years. If they 
you know, leave the, the soil to lie fallow or whatever, within three years, the residue is good enough. If it's really bad, uh, it might, may take five years for the residues to have gone from the soil, but at that point, we pass everybody. So, I mean, let's take modern, modern farming land. When I was young, soil <coughs> used to be dark brown. Now, where I am in Wiltshire, it, it, it's, it's faded because that rich humus, that the, the, the life in the soil is gone. You know, when I was young, you see the soil be ploughed and all the birds come down and eat, eat all, all the worms and everything. There are no birds now because there are no worms. I mean, when I was young, if you took a drive, let's say from here to an hour up the road, at this time of year, you used to have to have, to have special scraping devices and often people would have special spray cans of bug remover because it used to be Armageddon on your windscreen. It used to be that after about an hour's driving this time of year, you had to stop and wash your windscreens. Do, are any of you old enough to remember that? Yes. Yeah? Okay, so now I would challenge you to find one insect on your windscreen. You know, as opposed to Armageddon, we are looking at mass extinction. Right in front of everybody's face is their car windscreen, there is mass extinction. Where are the insects? They're gone. They're gone. You ask people, look, if 90% of the insects disappeared, would you do something about it? Most people say yes. You say, what if 95% of them disappeared? Would you personally do something? And most people would agree. You point out the windscreen, they realize that 99.9% .9 of them are gone. You know, where are the birds? Where are the bats? Where are the swallows? Uh, you know, uh, most people can ignore reality. You know, as they say, you can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. But, you know, people need to wake up because I think the definition of pollination sort of includes insects in there somewhere. And, um, you know, so that's my favourite one to wake, wake people up in the street, so to speak. Where are the insects? Uh, luckily, some people do say, well, I live in, you know, the middle of nowhere and there's still insects. But uh, I drove down here today and... Uh, I didn't have to stop. So, um, you know, the, the title of the talk is Why Are Cures Illegal? You know, probably most of you know about the 1939 Cancer Act. You know, the pharmaceutical industry, industry has been in control of government and made up the law since 1939 when they got the monopoly. You know, there are three monopolies in England that I know about. There, there's the dentists who have the monopoly on working on your teeth. Nobody else is allowed to do it. There's the Cancer Act, which gives the monopoly of cancer to doctors. And there's the Monopolies Commission, because obviously there should be two of those. Anyway. Um, so, it is a real problem uh, because clearly the doctors don't always get it right. You know, if I'd listened to the doctors, I would have been dead. You know, when I was in hospital, if I'd taken the drugs they'd suggested and done the operations that they'd suggested, I would be dead because they didn't know what they were doing and they admitted as much to me. So, um, about three years, two years maybe, after I recovered, uh, my dad's best friend uh, took me to one side and he'd, he'd had cancer once and they'd taken out a kidney and they'd done various things and he took me to one side and said, well, I'm sorry to tell you that um, I, the cancer's come back. And uh, I think, I can't remember how long he'd be given to, to live at that point, but it wasn't that long. But he, just, he knew what I'd done, uh, and he decided to, to go one step further, and he rang up Linus Pauling, who's the only person in the world to win the Nobel Prize as an individual twice. And he found him in the phone book in New York. And he rang up Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling said, look, uh, build up as fast as you can safely to a high dose of vitamin C. He recommended at least 30 grams a day. And my dad's best friend, um, actually, the story he told me after, after that was that he was on his way to the doctor's office in New York. And um, he got mugged. Six guys tried to mug him. And he hadn't been taking the chemotherapy, so he's still strong. He, he, if, you know, there are a lot of people who, if they don't do the chemo, uh, this is not always the case, but in many cases, they're still feeling all right. Okay, they've got this tumour and it's big, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, it's, that they're getting a bad effect from it. Anyway, he was still fit and strong, even though he'd been given a short time to live. And he decided, he was convinced he was going to die, by the way, at this point. He took on all six of them. He was a tough guy. 
took on all six of the muggers, broke one of their arms, and they all ran off screaming, and he kept his wallet. And he arrived at the, he was on his way to the doctors. He arrives at the doctors. The doctor said, well, I don't know what you've been doing, but, but we can't find the tumor. Gone. And he died 25 years later, and it wasn't a cancer. So I saw pretty clearly that the doctors don't always get it right. Yeah, they may want to get it right. You know, I'm not criticizing them, but they don't always get it right. And so I started to think, well, why do bodies go wrong? I started studying spontaneous remission. I started reading people's books and stories, the ones who, you know, they'd had a tumor the size of a basketball, and then suddenly they got better for, for some reason. And I wanted to know why. And I found the answer so quickly, it was silly. It was gratitude. It was gratitude. Gratitude is the big answer for everything. Gratitude. And what it was is they all said roughly the same story. They said, look, when it first happened, it, it was all about why me? It's so unfair. I'm so young. Uh, and it was anger, sadness, frustration, you know, all the negatives that you can imagine. And they said, but after a while, yeah, it was terrible. I had to suffer. After a while, I got grateful to the cancer or grateful to whatever it was. You know, I'm grateful that I got so ill I couldn't walk. So, like, you know, I'm grateful to it now because I learned so much from that experience that it was hell on earth. But actually now I'm quite pleased because I've got a profession. You know, I'm telling you about it, right? It was very useful and it was the gratitude that was this common factor with all the survivors. They said, I divorced the wife. I changed my job. I got over being raped as a child. I dealt with whatever it was. And that now, bizarrely, I'm grateful to it because of what happened. You know, a friend of mine, he saw these kids diving into water off the cliffs. And he thought, I could do that. And um, after they amputated his leg, he wasn't terribly happy. And, um, but now he's probably the happiest guy I know, and he lectures uh, and he loves pulling up his trousers and, and showing, showing his false leg, which he lost after the dive. And he's about the happiest person I know. And he said, well, obviously it was horrible losing the leg and all that. But actually, he, he, he wouldn't not lose it again. If he had the choice, he would lose it again because of the, the, the life's purpose and, you know, bizarrely, the joy that it gave him. So I tell people if they're suffering with, with an illness, even if you can't figure out why you're grateful, try and keep the grateful thing going. Um, Tony Robbins, you know, probably you've heard of Tony Robbins, he's the sort of motivational speaker, huge guy. He says that he can't meditate, he says, not in the traditional sense, he can't turn his mind off or whatever, but he spends 10 minutes a day being grateful. Just to, he says 10 minutes is enough, that's his version of meditation. And he says he'll be grateful to anything he can think of, you know, grateful to the breeze on his face, grateful to, it doesn't, ha doesn't matter how tiny it is, but just the attitude of, um, this sounds so American, doesn't it? The attitude of gratitude. Um, so if you've got the attitude of gratitude, um, it seems to fix stuff. It really does. And if you, let's say, let's say you've got some kids or some family or some friends, you can be just grateful for each one in in order, you can be grateful to the fact that you've had a nice breakfast or whatever, whatever it is. 10 minutes of gratitude seems to fix people's health. It seems to be huge, absolutely huge. And um, so, you know, I used to find, people used to come through my door, clients, and I got to the stage quite quickly where I could tell who was gonna live or die. It was quite obvious, it was quite obvious. Often I could tell on the phone, but I could always tell at the front door. And the difference was that there was there one type of client who'd, who'd come in and they say, I'll do anything you say. I will do anything you say. And they're the ones who are going to get better. And there are others, I'd say, well, look, how much water do you drink? And they say, well, I, I drink gl uh, one glass a day or something like that. And I say, well, look, you know, you've really got to sort of start building up because you know, your dehydration is a very serious problem for you. They say, oh, no, I couldn't. So what do you mean? No, no, I, I couldn't drink two glasses of water. I just couldn't do it. And, you know, they're just not going to make it. They're just not going to make it. And uh, so it really, you know, again, there are two types of people. The ones who get better are the ones who've got a reason to live, basically. They're the ones who say, I've got to live because I've got so much to do. And 
Then they're the ones, well, it depends. If they want to do it for somebody else, if their motivation is to be of service to others, they live. If their motivation is, well, I'm going to buy myself a new car and I'm going to buy, if it's all about them, uh, you know, this, honestly, this is the, the big thing, the gratitude and if you're being of service to others. You know, when we're young, we want to be of service to ourselves. We want new stuff and we want, it's all, all about us. And then at some point we realize that actually what makes us happy is other people telling us we're wonderful. You know, because there's a, a positive side of everything. There's positive selfishness. You know, we're, we're led to believe that selfishness is bad. But actually, the positive side of selfish is um, where we're doing it. Well, let me try and explain it this way. What really makes us happy is when somebody tells us that they love us, that we're doing something good. That's really what, what it's about. And ego is a good thing from the perspective that we need to hear that we're great. Um, you know, th th there are four questions, you know, a couple of secrets of relationships. There are four questions. I read it in some book somewhere. I can't remember which one. And if you were asked this question, what would you answer? Your loved one could do something for you. They could take you out. They could buy you a present. They could tell you that you're wonderful. Or they could do something around the home. So they could take you out, tell you you're wonderful, do something around the home, or buy you a present. So I started asking men and women this question. Now, most people just don't admit to, I want to be bought presents. Few people do, but not many people want to go for that one. A lot of people say they want to be taken out. A lot of people say that, um, quite a few people say they want, to do, want, they want stuff to do stuff around the house. But this was the big one. The women generally wanted to be taken out, generally. Some of them wanted stuff done around the house. The women almost never wanted to be told they're wonderful. I mean, some did, but the men, 95% of them wanted to be told they're wonderful. It was huge. The women know they're wonderful. They've got, you know, well, they do because they, you know, they can look after the house and they can look after the home and, you know, they've got to do it. They're hardwired to, to be wonderful, you know, in that way. And men can just flop on the sofa and mess about. Uh, so, how insecure are men? Wow, are they insecure? They are so insecure because they're not being told they're wonderful. They're just not being told it often enough. And um, it was so striking, so striking. And men, the women usually want to be taken out more. Uh, I don't know. Can I ask the women, what, what do you want? If you could get the brownie points, he can take you out, tell you you're wonderful, do something around the house, uh, or give you presents. What would most of you want? Do you want to just tell me? Be told I'm wonderful. You want to be told you're wonderful? You're wonderful. You're wonderful. Yeah. Something around the house. Something around the house? I want lots of hugs and I want to be told I'm absolutely fabulously wonderful. Brilliant. Ask me for a hug afterwards, you're wonderful. But I need lots of hugs to go with it. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll sort you out later. <laughs> uh, how about you? Um, probably to be told, you know, made to feel good. Also, I, I like going off to somewhere lovely. <laughs> so you're be taken out and told you're wonderful at the same yeah, time? probably going so, to some exotic place as well. And it, okay, so you want to... As well. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so, so are you with her? No, we're no. friends. Oh, uh, well, well, when you are with her, take her somewhere wonderful. <laughs> So, I mean... The reason is you could do a lot of the other things yourself, you see. So, what's that? The reason is you could do a lot of the other things yourself, you see. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't hug yourself. No. And there you are can't tell yourself you're wonderful in the same way somebody else can. No, well, that's true. I mean, it's the oxytocin thing. You know, we are starved of oxytocin. You, you can actually take oxytocin as a supplement. I'm not, not sure <laughs> quite how... Well, it's um, you know, certainly for people who are having a, a relationship problem, short term it seems that taking, taking some oxytocin, you can take it as a um, sublingual thing or as a nasal spray as far as I remember. Um, it can be good for relationships to suddenly make people fall back in love with one another. But I mean a hug is the biggest, the biggest creator of oxytocin you can get, just, just hugging. And you know, there are people out there who haven't been hugged for years. Have, you, have any of you seen that video called Free Hugs? There's a great video on YouTube called Free Hugs, and it started a movement around the world. And this guy, I think he's Australian or somewhere, somewhere he was feeling lonely, and he got uh, a, a, a sort of stick and put a big sign saying Free Hugs, and he got his friend to film it. And it's beautiful, make you cry. 
It's just fantastic. Free hugs. And last time I watched it was some years ago. I think 80 million people had watched it then, so by now it must be really going around the planet. Uh, there's another great video that's worth watching called Validation. Really fantastic validation. A um, few other videos while you're writing it down. Watch Reverse Pneumonia in Three Hours. Reverse Pneumonia in Three Hours, about how to use vitamin C properly. I mean, who would have thought you could reverse pneumonia in three hours? Well, according to Dr. Andrew Saul, he did. You can. You know, vitamin C is probably the biggest kept secret of the lot. Vitamin C is the one they really don't want you to know about because every vaccine essentially would be irrelevant uh, if people were taking enough vitamin C. So most doctors are taught that beyond a gram or so of vitamin C, it's useless and you just pee it out, that you can't use big doses. But in the 1930s onwards, 1940s, 50s, 60s in particular, doctors uh, like Dr. Cathcart, Dr. Klenner, and, and uh, um, various others were reversing everything from TB, smallpox, polio with vitamin C. Now, I knew somebody uh, who wore, wore iron calipers at school because he had polio, and his doctor wasn't taught that vitamin C would, would reverse polio. All viruses, as far as I'm aware, can be reversed with the right doses of vitamin C, so long as you've got everything else to go with it. You know, you c we all need just under 100 essential components to be healthy. Because while the doctors are taught that genetics are the big problem, and that's why we're not healthy, they're taught that there's a, you're, lack, you're low on drugs. We're taught that babies need, you know, we're, we're, sh we're short as human beings on cord clamping. We're, we're the only species that clamps the cord, for example. And the reason that cords were clamped in the first place is that um, uh, people, uh, the nurses didn't like the blood uh, uh, washing the uh, staining the floors, that babies have never been clamped for a good reason. Never, never, never. It's always been for convenience. You see, the human baby is so, so fabulously intelligent, the brain is so big it can't be born as one piece, so it comes out as two pieces. You know, there's the placenta, and the placenta is its packed lunch. The placenta uh, is its immune system, or 40% or so of its immune system, and it pumps all its contents into the baby, and once the placenta has emptied itself, uh, 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 the umbilical cord just drops off by itself. It is essential not to clamp the cord, but it's done. It's done routinely to clamp the cord, and nobody knows why. You ask the people clamping the cord, why are you doing that? They can't tell you, because there isn't a good reason. There is no reason, and they're depriving every baby of its birthright of uh, a proper, proper healthy immune system. Now. Um, the natural rate of caesareans is under 3%. How many caesareans uh, are being performed in Brazil right now? Over 80% of all births are by caesareans. 80. Over, over 80. 80. Uh, over 80% in Brazil. Who is running the show? Who, who is running things for, for what purpose? What is the caesarean rate in England? It's huge. Way, way beyond what it needs be because people want elective caesareans these days. The doctors quite like it because they can do it in office hours. And people quite like it because they can fit it in with their hair appointment. You know, it's a good birth on Friday because, I, you know. Um, so things have been taped, you know, which is safer, having a baby at home or having a baby at hos in hospital? Now, people have babies in hospital because they believe it's safer. The statistics say otherwise. Well, who is they to decide about you? Uh, uh, you're having a natural process. You're not having a medical procedure. No, I've, been, I've been kind of steadfast and keep up banging on about it, but they said because my first one was an emergency C-section, uh, it's going to be too dangerous. Well, you see, you've got to look, why was it a c Why do C-sections happen? Well, if you were low on magnesium, uh, you might not be able to give birth properly. I have a pre Is that true? Well, you had pre Of course it is. Um, you know. Well, well, you see, you know, before I do, did what I, you know, I've worked in, as, in several professions, ophthalmic optics for about 15 years, but I also worked in hypnosis. And um, the reason that I now do what I'm doing is that hypnosis wasn't enough. If somebody needs magnesium, they need magnesium. And, you know, I can hypnotize somebody to, to relax. You know, I got 
uh, taught uh, uh, you know painless birth techniques so you can you know uh, you, you, you can say you, you can do self hypnosis you can th there are there are CDs you can get subliminals you can't actually hear them and the words that are being said are all about expansion doctors use words like contractions it's the very opposite of what's going on you're not getting contractions you're getting expansions right and there is hypnosis involved in the way the doctors speak and it's not positive hypnosis it is not positive you tell a woman she's she's having contractions what do you think that does for the subconscious it's insanity when you know that obviously to give birth you're having expansions so if a woman is low on that makes perfect sense well exactly i've got a video on youtube about orgasmic birth i mean we all know that Pleasure and pain are, are a whisker away to some degree. Um, you know, all the, all the erotic dances, uh, belly dancing and so on, all, all those dances where women swing their hips, this is birth practice. It's all birth practice. Women, not all women, many women who are taught how to give birth properly by, by swiveling the hips and various techniques are having orgasms instead of pain. Right, uh, and I can give you give you uh, details of the uh, of the video. There's, you, you can watch a film called Birth into Being, Birth into Being by made by Elena Tonetti. I've got some interviews with her on YouTube as well. Her film is is magical. It shows you the orgasmic births. It shows people having births with dolphins. You name it, and uh, birth does not have to be painful. I mean, afraid in many cases it, it can be but it doesn't have to be. Now, if you have prepared for it, I mean, all the ancient cultures used to have special sacred foods they'd eat prior to conception, you know, because... Uh, but look, did you know that all birth defects uh, are preventable? Doesn't matter whether it's Down syndrome. Down syndrome is not chromosome damage, which the doctors are taught. It's not. You can see a Down syndrome baby in the womb at two months using high quality modern ultrasound equipment. You can see it in two months and you can correct it in the womb so the baby will be born normal, right? All the birth deficiencies, well, no, sorry. Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy are selenium deficiencies, right? They're not chromosome damage, they're selenium deficiencies. So they can spot Downs in the womb at two months, they can give the woman selenium and obviously you'd give them all the other nutrients that they're almost certainly going to be lacking, and the baby will be born normal. How do I know this? Because Dr. Joel Wallach sued the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in America, to prove that selenium uh, deficiency was the cause of uh, cystic fibrosis, then muscular dystrophy, then Downs. So is it criminal that doctors aren't taught this? I would say it's criminal that doctors aren't taught this. Now, uh, what did doctors do in the old days? Well, let's say a child got measles, right? Um, the, in the old days, uh, the doctors knew, this would be sort of 40s, 50s, 60s, that if you gave a child who'd got measles uh, vitamin C, they would get better. Vitamin C, because it cures all viruses. Sorry, that's spelt with a K, that cure, spelt with a K. Um, the... What the doctors would do, if measles was very serious for a child and it had been left untreated, a child can go blind, right? Now, what did the doctors do with a blind child? They injected them with vitamin A and their sight would come back. Vitamin A restored the sight of children who'd lost their sight because of measles. Do they teach this to doctors these days? I don't know. I don't know, but they should because vaccines are are causing the most desperate damage. Um, who knows uh, what a human diploid cell is? You know what a human diploid cell, right, okay. Correct. Correct. It is aborted fetal cells and that's what they're, cu that's what they're cultivating vaccines on in many cases these days. Now previously they were using chicken's eggs so you're getting the DNA of a chicken. After that, they used monkey kidneys. 
So you're getting all the viruses that are in monkey kidneys, and there are many, many viruses that they're injecting people. They're injecting monkey viruses, but now it's just straight cannibalism. They're injecting the DNA of other human beings. No. Because uh, the drugs industry does what it likes, doesn't it? They can rush through an untested drug, but they'll try and ban apricot kernels. You know, it's, it's just a joke. Um, so I uh, have made some videos with uh, several of the leading figures in this field. I made a video about GC Math with David Noakes. So, do any of you know what GC Math is? All right, okay. So David Noakes uh, is a very, very brave individual. He started manufacturing GC math, and he started announcing pub publicly, and I'm speaking as a reporter now and spelling it with a K, that the clinics in Switzerland and Germany were reversing 80% of stage 4 cancer, which is unheard of, unheard of. And he was also saying that 25% of the autistic children are uh, using it, and there is a protocol. It's not just one thing there is a protocol, we're reversing uh, all the symptoms of their autism. Now, uh, Dr. Marco Ruggiero was working with David at this point to develop this product, and he then realized that by adding olive oil to it, it made it 25% more effective. Simple as that. Then, about a year ago, he realized that everyth all the reason, everything he... Th how he realized a year ago that the mechanism by which GCMAF was having these incredible results, he'd completely misunderstood it and got it totally wrong. And he'd thought that it was GCMAF that was doing the good work, but it turned out not to be. Didn't need to have GCMAF in it at all. And he's come out with a new version, which is this, called Rarum. And this is made from three well-known ingredients, olive oil, vitamin D, and chondroitin. Now, vitamin D we know about, sunshine, Olive oil, we know about, oleic acid, and chondroitin has been used for decades. The Mayo Clinic did studies uh, uh, using a case, again, cures and, uh, curing cancer with chondroitin. Chondroitin is in Boots the Chemist. It's glucosamine and chondroitin is the famous arthritis remedy that, that all, the, all the, the pharmacists would recommend. So it's made of three materials that are super tested and well known. You know, the Mayo Clinic in America has used chondroitin. It's super well known. So they're going to have trouble shutting it down. So they're shutting down the people. I spoke to Marco Ruggiero um, yesterday as we were due, due to do another interview. I've done several with him. One of them I had to take down. Uh, and he said, I'm sorry, uh, he, he can't, um, can't make any more videos. I made another video with Kerry Rivera, who wrote the book Reversing the Symptoms Known as Autism, and uh, she's in hiding somewhere in Europe. Um, uh, Dr. Ruggiero had dinner with Dr. Jeffrey Bradstreet in America the day before he shot himself with a shotgun and climbed up a bridge and threw himself off. We didn't really, didn't he? Not old yeah. Well, it's a little difficult to... <laughs> yeah, it's the official story. Uh, he had dinner with him the night, night before, and you see, Dr. Bradstreet, he was the lawyer, doctor, brother, who would go into court and say to the judge, it was the vaccine that caused this child's autism. So he wasn't very popular. And he also recommended GC math and was giving it to the children. And 25% of them were losing the symptoms altogether. What is this, GC math? GC math, it's a protein that lives in, in your liver. Everybody who's healthy has got maybe a billionth of a gram or some tiny amount of GCMAF within them. But if they're ill, let's say one billion of the population of the planet are, are ill, they haven't got the GCMAF. Maybe it's the virus that's wiped it out or whatever. So if you put the GCMAF back in again, uh, a lot of people get better. And, uh, but there is a whole protocol to it. It's not, you know, the GCMAF will get a certain number of people just better by itself. But when you combine it with a ketogenic diet, which I'll discuss, when you combine it with uh, various other supplements, suddenly you can get people's health back. How so, do you spell GC, GC MAF. Yes, but as yeah, MAF is macrophage activating factor. GC relates to a GC protein. MAF macrophage <coughs> activating factor, and macrophages 
They're a bit like phagocytes. Oh, yes. that blood cells, they sort of eat things. Exactly, it's a Pac-Man of the bloodstream. They eat cancer cells and the nasty stuff. They're very useful, you want them. Clive, um, how is David Noakes doing that? Because the last time I spoke to him, they had him on the, the merry-go-round of court pieces. And well, I haven't really hear anything from him personally since. He's okay. Um, as far as I know, I mean, the, you see, you know, he, he made one or two sort of wonderful errors, you might say. He was living in Guernsey, which is outside of the Cancer Act, as is Northern Ireland. And um, he uh, basically announced to all the people of Guernsey that he'd, he'd uh, cure their cancer for free. So he emptied the hospitals and had hundreds of hundreds of the ex-patients, and of course he was getting, as he claims, 80% success rate. Uh, so um, the British government raided his lab, stole everything on false pretenses, they broke into his house, ripped the safe out the wall, the safe out of the floor, damaging the structure of the building. They froze all his bank accounts, they froze all his family's bank accounts, they froze his PayPal account with 50 grand in it. And um, I spoke to him last, when this happened a year or whatever it was ago, a year and a half ago, and I said, how are you? And he said, uh, well, lost 90% of the customers, and um, I wake up every morning surprised I haven't got a bullet in my back. Because, you know, there have been 35 dead doctors so far around this subject, supposedly, allegedly. All in America, by the way, not, not England. So um, it's a bit of a hot topic, really. But GCMAF had a blood component, a human blood component, um, they bought the blood off the Red Cross. I'm sure the people who donated their blood didn't realize they were flogging it. Um, anyway, uh, the new product, Rarum, doesn't involve any blood. It just involves con chondroitin, vitamin C, and vit oh, sorry, vitamin D and olive oil. So they're going to have a job shutting this one down. Uh, but they are scaring everybody. And uh, so it's made by Dr. Reinwald, and he was the... the uh, the guy who ran uh, some of the clinics in Switzerland and Germany who were getting the results. And I've met Dr. Reinwald, fantastic man, and he has some very interesting products. Not only does he have this, but he also has something called PectiClean. And now, some of you may have heard of something called a Herxheimer reaction, otherwise known as a healing crisis. Some people do too much good stuff at once and they just feel awful. It can be, let's say, let's say they kill too many parasites and now they've got dead parasites in their bloodstream. That can make you feel ill, you know, that kind of thing. So Dr. Reinwald just developed this thing called PectiClean. It's actually modified pectin, which, you know, pectin you get in apples and so on. It's what you use to set jam. Anyway, he reckons that if you are getting this healing crisis, suddenly you've, you're, you're, in, you're feeling like flu, flu symptoms, you're feeling awful, take one of these PectiCleans, 20 minutes later, he says it turns it off. It literally sucks up the toxins, the heavy metals that you've just released. Um, so he's got... Contain like clay as well? It's no, no, it's just got, just, just pectin, just pectin, apparently. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, and there's so many interesting people saying interesting things. One of the guys I really have time for, another German guy, is Dr. Klinghart. Dr. Klinghart invented kinesiology, muscle testing. Do any of you know what muscle testing is? Yeah. 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 So this guy invented it. He is great. Check out Dr. Klinghart on YouTube. Uh, amazing, amazing level of information. And he's, he's using Rarum a lot, as, as are quite a lot of people. Well, Klinghart. Klinghart, yeah. K-L-I-N-G-H-A-R-T. Uh, there are a few other people that are worth checking out. One of them is Dr. Tent. If you haven't come across Dr. Tent on YouTube, genius. Tent. Tent, T-E-N-T, -E uh, Ameri American health specialist. Um, okay, let me tell you a few other things. Um, you know, different countries have got different health things going on. The Russians, for instance, they don't have the big pharmaceutical industry like the Europeans and the Americans. They rely on other techniques. And this is a Russian device. Um, and I use this a lot. This um, is sold in England called a pain genie. And they cost about 450 quid. And they run on a little 9 volt battery. And I used to use, for getting people out of pain particularly, and shrinking things, 
I used to use a big device called an Indiva, which is a Spanish device, basically a Nik Nikola Tesla radio frequency device. And you see, cancer cells can't survive over about 43 degrees C, whereas you, a human being, can uh, go up to about 47 degrees C without expiring. So by using high temperatures, cancer cells cannot survive. Similarly, uh, the Nobel Prize was won in 1931 by Otto Warburg for showing that if you deprive a regular cell of oxygen to survive, it starts burning glucose, changing from aerobic to anaerobic, and that's the definition of a cancer cell uh, where it's been deprived of oxygen. So you can use oxygen, again, to uh, revert cells back to normal, because you can either kill cancer cells or you can revert them turn them back to normal, and obviously turning them back to normal would be, the, be a, a better way to go. Anyway, back to this little device. Um, this little device has been used to reverse eye problems from macular degeneration to retinal problems. It um, is licensed for pain relief, but uh, if anybody's in pain, uh, I'll use it on them afterwards or in the break or whatever, and it'll get you out of pain almost right away more or less most of the time. Um, it's a fantastic little device, very, very simple to use and um, uh, has so many uses, it's incredible. They developed it supposedly for the space race because up in space, if anybody got ill, they, were sh they couldn't sh take drugs because they were sharing the water supply and what, how do they know what drugs to take and they had a weight limit. So they put about 130 of the Russians' best scientists from the secret space program and the secret soldier program to develop this device because they'd watched Star Trek. They'd seen devices like this on Star Trek, so they, they knew what they wanted. And uh, these are incredible, just incredible. Like what it does is it sends a signal, electrical signal into the body and the body responds and it reads it. So every sort of microsecond or whatever, it sends frequencies in the body responds and it cha changes and, and you can set it in various different ways. You can set it to dose itself, so you just hold it on a point and it'll just send a dose in or you can um, use it uh, on the Chinese meridian lines. So generally speaking, most people use it just on the arm because the arm's easily accessible. You could use it on a finger, you could use it on the earlobe, you could use it on the place of pain itself, but because of the, the way that Chinese thinking goes with, with, with health, um, you know, this, this each uh, piece of um, s single bone structure can represent the entire body. So you can use this and depending on, uh, you, you, what, what you do is you rub it over the skin and then suddenly you find you've got a sticky bit and that sticky bit uh, relates to some blockage somewhere and you can tell where it is as to what part of the body uh, the blockage is often. So you can, you, it's quite an interesting little diagnosis tool sometimes. Um, and it's very effective. You can often unblock things in two, two minutes. You, you wanted to ask a yeah. question? Well, just going to say, um, I have a detached retina. So you, you said about... Yeah, detached retina, it's probably not going to help with... Um, yeah, certainly not. Yeah. Um, yeah, a diabetic, yeah it's, it's a problem once it's detached. I'm sorry about that. Um, but... Almost everything that the doctors believe in, in total good faith is not repairable, not reversible. Almost everything is. There are even people now coming off dialysis. And I'm not saying that anybody, everybody can come off dialysis. But the doctors are taught that once your kidney is shrunk, that that's it. But people are reinflating them and coming off dialysis, which you know, doctors would say, well, it's impossible. But of course, they're seeing it now. They're witnessing it now. Um, You've got to remember that most, a lot of so-called diseases, fibromyalgia, which means nothing more than multiple muscle pain, basically, that didn't used to exist. And it's not a disease. It's not like a, a virus or something like that. Uh, fibromyalgia is toxicity and nutrient deficiency. In fact, almost every disease is toxicity and nutrient deficiency. Type 2 diabetes, that was virtually unheard of 100 years ago. Cancer hundred years ago, virtually unheard of. Heart attacks, virtually unheard of. hundred years ago, Professor Alzheimer hadn't even seen 
Alzheimer's disease. You've got to remember that when people name it after themselves, that's because nobody's ever seen it in the world before. It's not that there was always dementia. No, there wasn't. This is all new. Um, you know, the cause of dementia uh, was when they came out with modern ways to process oils, when they came out with margarine. You know, the, your brain is made of two things primarily. Water, so if you're dehydrated, you can't think straight. If you're dehydrated, your eyes don't work properly. So, but the, let's say, took the water bit out, now you've got the wobbly jelly bit of your brain. What's that made of? Cholesterol, primarily. Your brain's made of fat. So anybody who's been eating a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet has been unwittingly uh, turning their brain into Swiss cheese. Holes where the brain should be. And that's what Alzheimer's brain looks like. Gaps. For years now, I've worked on the basis that my great-grandparents lived well, in, well into their 80s and into their 90s as farming people with dairy herds and eating butter and bacon and eggs and so on. And when all this thing came out about having to these, have these fancy margarines, I just said, no, not have it yet. We can eat real butter. The key thing is to have a normal amount of butter and not to overdo it. Just have a normal, reasonable amount of butter. Butter's been around for hundreds of years. It's safe. I don't like the idea of the hydrogenated oils. So from what you're saying, I've accidentally done the right thing <laughs> and helped prevent myself get, get dementia. If you've been eating uh, butter, that... that, that, that... No margarines in the house. Yes, no, you, you did the right thing. However, you've got to remember that things have changed from probably from those days. I mean, um, if you milked a cow, you took the milk, and you pasteurized it, and you gave it back to the baby cow, the chances are the baby cow would be very ill, might even die, because you've just murdered its food. You know, milk is white blood cells and colostrum and uh, all this healthy stuff, lots of bacteria. The moment you pasteurize it, you heat it up past 70 degrees, it's dead. You've killed it. So if you're eating unpasteurized butter, it's not the whole, the whole deal. Uh, yes, there's still, still good cholesterol in there, but there's a big difference between uh, pasteurized and unpasteurized dairy. It's huge. But you can't buy unpasteurized. Yes, you can. Seems to be almost impossible. I've never seen it. Okay, Waitrose sell unpasteurized butter. Oh. Uh, it's about the only place. It's not organic, unfortunately, but, it, but they do sell unpasteurized. And if they don't sell it, if you ask them, they're generally very good and will get it for you. But, you know, the, the, the supermarkets are a big problem. I went into All Dye the other day <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went looking for food. I took my camera and they chucked me out unfortunately but I went looking for food and I couldn't find any in all dye. I couldn't find any. It was, I mean food in my opinion is wrapped in skin. Right? Cheese, pigs, potatoes, you know generally, I mean not all food is wrapped in skin but, but generally it is. And uh, I couldn't find any. It was all poisoned. I couldn't find one single product that w was natural. Even the organic products, they had organic cheese, they had organic milk, but it had been pasteurized, so it was dead. There was no real food in all dye. Then, you know, people wonder why they go to supermarkets and they find their weight rises. That's because they go to weight rows. You know, your weight rises at weight rows, depending on what you eat. And there's not much healthy food in there either, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I, I'm forced to shop there because I only eat organic and it's difficult to find it in where I live. Uh, although I have got a fabulous um, Japanese farm just down the road from me. They practice a healing art called jure. And I asked them, you know, how do you, how do you fertilize the land? Are you, you know, what are you doing? And they said, we only use love. And they do. They only use love, and their food is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, the thing is that uh, we make a mistake with agriculture of digging. You don't need to turn the soil at all to grow crops. You don't need to. And the Japanese have got a, a no-dig system, which I admire greatly. There is no need to dig. Let's say that you wanted to turn your back garden into a food production unit. Let, let's just say for argument, it's 
totally covered in grass and you would like to have a food production unit there. Do you need to dig? No. No, you don't. You don't need to dig at all, ever. You go to a local person who does um, horticulture, agriculture, you know, like a tree, person who chops down branches and chips them in a wood chip machine. They have to pay money to get those wood chips taken away. You ask them to dump nine inches of wood chips on your, on your grass. You might want to put a bit of uh, newspaper down to help the grass just die. Nine inches of wood chips. Now think about the wood chips, right? Um, 150 years ago, our ancestors to cook lunch would have got some wood, burnt it, and then the ash, they would have taken outside and sprinkled it outside. Now, they also would have grown the vegetables right outside the back door. You know, who would have wanted to walk to your veg patch? So, and this doesn't matter where you are in the world, it is traditional to take the ash from the, from the wood fire and sprinkle it on your veg patch. Because, think about it, the trees, whose roots are usually a lot deeper than the tree is high, have gone through all those layers of minerals, all those layers of rocks, and they've mined right the way through, maybe hundreds of feet, to bring up in the wood all life, because all life is in the soil. Every, everything that's lived and died has gone back into the soil. So the soil is a perfect mineral balance. So when we started having gas fires and ovens made with electric ovens, we stopped, we broke the cycle of putting the minerals back. So if you want to do gardening and you get those wood chips, nine inches of them, each time it rains, minerals come out in perfect balance. So let's say your soil underneath that grass, you can't even dig it, it's like rock. Right? After a year or so of the water going, going through and trickling the minerals through, the life in the soil will come back. And after about two or three years, you'll just be able to put your hand right in the soil and it'll all be soft and friable and lovely. You can recondition the soil, and there's no digging involved. So let's say you want to now plant. You've got your nine inches of wood chips. You, you, you're going to have to start to begin with with, with, with seedlings that are already growing in, in, a, in a pot. And you might want to put it in there uh, and just pile the wood chips around. And slowly it'll grow up, but all, all the weeds will be suppressed by the wood chips. Only what you want to plant and make sure it's, it's a bit open so you can get it started. You can watch a film on YouTube called Back to Eden. This guy came back from Vietnam, bought a plot of land, and it was beautiful and verdant and everything was nice. And then by July or something, he'd lost all his crops because there was a, a drought and he'd lost everything. And depressed, he goes into the forest to, to work out what to do now with his life. And he realizes there's no drought going on in the forest. He suddenly realizes that he's been taught crop rotation but there's no crop rotation going on in the forest. The wild strawberries are always in the same plot. They're fine. And he realizes that what's going, what's going on is the wood chips. The, you know, the, the trees have been dropping bits of branches and so on, and there's this layer of covering in the forest. So nobody's having to water, nobody's having to fertilize, nobody's having to do anything. So he just copied it. And this is what you can do. Watch back to Eden. Now, many years later, you know, he, he, he doesn't water, he, doesn't, he hardly has to weed. And Every month on YouTube, there's a tour of his garden, the Back to Eden garden, where people eat vegetables that they've never eaten in a million years, go, this is the sweetest, most delicious thing I've ever tasted because of this mass mineralization. So I think that the most important job in the future, at least for kids, will be organic gardening. Not organic farming, organic gardening. So you can turn small areas into food production units. And let's say you haven't got a garden. Well, what I do is I sprout seeds. You can make a salad, or you could get, you, know, the, you can buy online seeds for sprouting, not the expensive 50 seeds for two quid in the garden center, but you can get a you know, quarter of a kilo of broccoli seeds or alfalfa seeds or um, chive seeds or onion chives or onion seeds or whatever. You can make a salad that's absolutely fresh that you've grown yourself just by sprouting seeds. It's easy. Um, so if you haven't sprouted seeds before, it's so ridiculously easy. Go on, go on YouTube. You don't need any equipment. You just soak some seeds in, in, in a, a glass jar for half a day, strain them off, leave them in the glass jar damp, then rinse them twice a day, and within two or three days they'll be sprouting. And let's say you put in 
an eighth of an inch of seeds, you can fill the entire jar in a week with fresh sprouts. Very cheap, cost you pennies for a salad, absolutely pennies, and you, could, you can sprout loads of things. I'm sprouting at the moment at home red clover, I'm sprouting pea sprouts, pumpkin, sesame seeds, alfalfa, all sorts of things. It's so easy, you can eat for almost nothing, and it's fresh. You can be on the 35th floor of a council block and have fresh vegetables every day. The other big one, of course, is fermenting, fermenting foods. Um, our ancestors here in England, to get through a cold winter, how would they have done it? Because, you know, the, all the rivers were frozen. Three, 200 years ago, was it? The Thames used to freeze for two months or something. There was ice skating in all the rivers. You couldn't dig, you couldn't grow anything for maybe six months of the year. So how did they get through it? Well, they had to salt food away. They'd salt hams and hang them up to dry in the, in the air. They'd make cheeses, they'd make pickles, chutneys, jams, wines, beers. They'd pickle onions, they'd pickle peppers, they'd pickle any cabbage, anything they had. You know, at the end of the season, they'd, they'd pickle it. And how do you pickle stuff? It's so simple. You go to a glass jar and you, you chop the stuff up small, ram it in and pour salt, salt water over it, put a lid on, put it in a dark cupboard and leave it. You don't make pickles by adding vinegar. The water that you add becomes vinegar, right? It ferments, becomes vinegar. So our ancestors got a fresh load of bacteria every winter, loads of it. And you see, what we're doing now is we're drinking maybe uh, chlorinated water. Now, if we're drinking chlorinated water, we're drinking bleach, and it's killing all the good bacteria. And 80% plus of our immune system is the bacteria. They've now just realized just last year that actually not only do you have bacteria in your, in your gut, which are doing the thinking for you, doing the digestion for you. You've all, you also got bacteria they now know in the brain, and the, your brain, the thinking power of your brain is partly bacteria. It used to be thought that your brain was you, the human cells, but we're outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria. Right? We've got 10 times more bacteria in us than we have human cells in us. So the scientists will say, well, you aren't the bacteria, but you are. You are the bacteria, you are the fungus, and they've now proved it's doing, doing some of your thinking for you. you know, because we haven't just got the one brain in our head. They, they found many years ago now that you've got you know, neural cells all the way through the gut, all the way through. So you know, that gut feeling, you know, you're thinking with your gut. Then they now uh, have found that there are, there are more messages coming from the heart to the brain than the other way around. So the brain, it is also, uh, sorry, the heart is also a brain, you could say your emotional brain. Then men uh, uh, think with a fourth brain, very often, which is lodged in their trousers. And uh, anyway, there are various brains. Um, so is it important to look after the bacteria? Yes, it is. It so is. And anybody who's got um, arthritis or any of what they call an autoimmune disease, you can almost be guaranteed that they've got a leaky gut caused by the modern breads. Okay, and a lack of bacteria. So the bacteria has been... Sorry? Specifically the breads. All the grains. You know, one of the big problems... Do come and join us. Uh, come and sit down if you want to. The, the grains are the, are the big problem. Because they've changed the grains, um, you know... Uh, I'm at, what is the best way to get better? Well, I would suggest a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is the best single remedy to get better. If I had cancer with a K, the first thing I'd be doing is I'd be coming off all grains, including rice. I'd be coming off all grains, I'd come off all starchy vegetables, and I would come off, come off all sweet fruit. So what's, what's that leaving me with? It's leaving me with any vegetables that aren't starchy. It's leaving me with mushrooms, nuts, seeds, eggs, uh, some meats, I'd be very specific, and fish. I would only eat fish that's very young and oily, like sardines, mackerel, sprats, herring, that sort of thing, because they're young, so they've had no time to build up mercury and other toxins, and they're fatty, which is 
very, very good brain food. I would, if I was eating meat, I would only want to, and fish as well, I only eat stuff that isn't farmed. Because all the farm stuff, the salmon, the pigs, the chickens, they're feeding them all soya. And whereas the EU has banned, in theory, genetically modified foods entering the food chain, they're feeding genetically modified foods to all the animals if they're not organic. So you eat cheese, for instance. If it's, been, if it's not organic, they will have fed that cow genetically modified soya. And so your soya is whatever it is, half, ca half caterpillar and half wheat or whatever it is. You know, they're, they're doing ridiculous things with all, with all the food. So you don't want genet genetically modified soya. You really don't. And it, soya is, is very poisonous for a lot of people. You know, who was the most famous advocate of soya? It was Linda McCartney. What happened to her? Estrogen-based breast cancer, as far as I'm aware, and I would almost guarantee it was brought about by the soya. Why did um, Steve Jobs die? He was a vegetarian, yet really healthy, yet soya all the time. Soya sausages, soya burgers, all that stuff. Uh, and he died of cancer. Now, the, the thing is that his cancer was really slow growing, Steve Jobs. He, it would have started maybe 25 years before he realized he had it. You see, cancers work at different rates. Some are very fast and you've got to be super quick. Others are really slow. Prostate cancer, bowel cancer, often very slow. Prostate cancer, um, they uh, actually, uh, a cure in the doctor's terms is called 10-year survival. Most cancers, a cure is called 5-year survival. The prostate is so slow. Um, but everybody thinks that all cancers are going to kill them right away because that's what the media leads us to believe. So it turns out that the test um, for, for bowel cancer, for instance, is more dangerous than bowel cancer. The test for prostate cancer is more dangerous than prostate cancer, so I'm told by Jennifer Daniels, the Harvard-educated medical doctor. Because um, people think it's a death sentence. If the doctor, if the, they say, what, what can I do? I've got prostate cancer. What can I do? And the doctor says, well, we can give you chemotherapy or we could operate. They say, yes, please, thinking they're going to die, thinking that's their best option, but doing nothing is their best option by far, by far. It's, it's really worth looking at the statistics because they lie about the statistics. You know, you know, you know the, the, the thing, lies, damned lies and statistics. This is how they do it. Macmillan, the charity, right? You think they're on your side? Macmillan were famous a few years ago and it was in all the press. They said, early diagnosis of breast cancer saves lives. And how, how, they, how they worked this out, they took two women. Now, breast cancer has uh, uh, a cycle from when there's the, f the first cell splits and becomes cancerous, then there's a, a, a doubling, a doubling, a doubling. So it takes about seven years, basically, for breast cancer. So it probably takes more than that. But when they can first spot it with a mammogram, there's about a seven-year period. So let's take two women. Now, there's the, um, the lucky one, the Macmillan lucky woman. She gets diagnosed early with cancer. So it's a seven-year cycle. So at year one, she gets diagnosed. They find something, it's one centimeter or 20 millimeters or barely visible. And they say, oh, if we act now, we might be able to save your life. So they start giving the lucky woman at one year in chemotherapy. Maybe they, she gets a double mastectomy, rebuild, you know, all radiation, whatever it is. And she has six extra years of life and dies on the seventh year. So she's lucky, six extra years of life or five extra years of life. Now there's the unlucky woman. Now it's going to take about six years for a lump to be found by the lucky woman. So she's had six years of joyful life, totally unaware that she's got cancer. Then she finds the lump and in one year she's dead. So she had late diagnosis, so she only lived one year. So do you get it? So. The lucky woman gets six extra years of no breasts and lots of pain and no hair, whereas the unlucky woman, six years of bliss and one year of pain. It's a life, isn't it? Versus no quality yeah. of life. So, so people just read that, oh my God. The lucky woman listens to you and takes masses and masses of vitamin C. 
Well, um, <laughs> you know, there's a reason why everybody gets ill, and it's very seldom genetic, for instance, as the doctors might say. You, know, doc you say, why have I got cancer, doctor? And they'll say, well, we don't know. They'll say, well, it's bad luck. Uh, you haven't been exercising. Um, it's your genes. It, it's you. It's all your fault, basically. That's what they basically say. But they don't, they don't know why. Uh, but I can tell you why. Because there are only three reasons why anybody gets ill full stop. And those three reasons might be physical damage. You've been hit by a lorry and, well, now you're ill. Okay, let, let's just rule physical damage out. Two other reasons. Toxicity and nutrient deficiency. And let's face it, we're all toxic. You can't help it. If you're breathing, if you're eating, we're all toxic. So we've all got a, po a, po a load of poisons in us. And we're all nutrient deficient because the food isn't what it was. The old varieties had seeds in. You know, cucumbers, you probably remember, used to be bent. And if you remember, if you're old enough, they used to have seeds, big viable seeds in a cucumber that you could plant. Every apple, every grape, every orange, every mandarin, they all had viable seeds. You could dry them and plant them. Now, most things are seedless. So if, if a bull, a prize bull, were seedless, it wouldn't be a prize bull. It would be totally useless. And we're led to believe that seedless grapes are good for us. How can something that's too weak even to reproduce itself be any good nutrition-wise? Right? We're, eating, we're eating seedless bull. It's, it's, we're eating rubbish. And besides which, the soil's destroyed. There, you know. Once you've dug the soil, you've broken the mycelial fungal net just under the ground. The biggest entity in the world, they reckon, is a, some, something like 30 miles wide, and it's one mycelial net un, under the ground. You know, all the mushrooms join up. All the trees join up. Underneath, all the roots combine. Trees will keep a stump alive, right? It's still granny. Okay, it's been cut down. They'll keep it alive, you know, from underneath. Um, there is communication. You know, all these plants communicate. I was in the lie detector business some years ago. I got fed up with being robbed, so I went into the lie detector business, and I made contact with the most famous person in the lie detector business, an American guy called Cleve Baxter. He wrote a book called Primary Perception. And what, he was the first person ever to take his lie detector. He, was, he had a big rubber plant in the office. He connected it to a leaf, and he was just thinking, what would happen if I cut the leaf? And the plant responded. The plant read his mind. And so he did lots of experiments. He started experiments with everything he could find, more plants. He took um, a pot of live yogurt, divided it into two poured boiling water on one pot of yogurt, and in the other room he had the probes from his lie detector. The yogurt responded to its other half being boiled. He, did exp he wondered whether it could be his mind that was affecting the experiment, so he set up a robot arm to pour boiling water on some prawns and wired up the rubber plant again. The second the, 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 the prawns died, the rubber plant went mental. He started taking swabs of human um, saliva, flying it on the fastest jet, putting the probes in the saliva, affecting the person, and the saliva would react. He was the first person to prove that we're all one, that everything is one. We're all connected. Time, distance is immaterial. Primary perception. Have a read of it. What's his name? Cleve, C-L-E-V-E, -E, Baxter, B-A-X-T-E-R. Primary perception. They made a film about it called The Secret Life of Plants. Stevie Wonder did an album about it called The Secret Life of Plants. I had somebody come to me who explained to me that had diarrhea for nine months. I had some water kefir. Now, you can buy kefir, milk kefir or water kefir, on eBay for a quid. Or if you really want to lash out, spend a fiver and get loads of it. It's like a pet. It grows, and you have to look after it. And you can make a delicious drink with it. With the milk kefir, you can make a strong yogurt. With the water kefir, you can make an absolutely delicious thing out of any type of fruit juice or water and sugar. It's amazing. I gave some water kefir to this guy who'd had diarrhea for nine months, and within three days, he rings me up and says the diarrhea's completely stopped. I also gave him some vitamins and minerals as I do everybody. I had a client about six or seven years ago 
who had gone into hospital for a minor shoulder operation come out with MRSA. She'd had, when I met her, she'd had MRSA for three years. It's a flesh-eating disease. You pick it up all the time in hospitals. Something like, I can't remember what the percentage is, but I, th I think I've read that maybe 20% of people go into hospital and come out with an infection they didn't, didn't enter with. So MRSA, um, I told, told this woman, uh, take the supplements I always recommend, um, and I got her to drink colloidal silver. Um, she rang me up six days later. Now, she'd, be, she'd been given every drug for three years by the doctor that they had, and every antibiotic that they had. The doctors had given up on her. She couldn't look after her five children. She was in her 30s. Uh, she explained to me that this flesh-eating disease was now in one of her eyes, which is not where you want a flesh-eating disease. Six days later, she rings me up and says, well, I say, how's the MRSA? She says, 95% better. I said, 95% better? She said, 95% better. Two weeks after that, she goes to the doctor for, for her regular checkup. Gone. Clean bill of health. Clean bill of health. Colloidal silver. Um, I got invited onto the panel advising the Sierra Leone government about what to do with Ebola. It was me and about 12 other people, Patrick Holford, the ex-health correspondent of the Times, all sorts of people, and we, we gave our opinions of what, what should be done for Ebola. And vitamin C, colloidal silver, and ozone were the three remedies that everybody basically agreed with. And um, the, the ex-health um, correspondent of the Times was very interesting. He explained to everybody there, the ambassador and everybody, um, what he'd learned about AIDS. You know, as the health correspondent for the, for the London Times, he'd been writing about AIDS for years. And I'd seen AIDS, or what I thought was AIDS. I remember going on holiday to an island called Key West in America, in the Florida Keys. And in Key West at that point, virtually everybody was gay, and they were all dying. The whole island was full of these very thin, gray people dying. And I believed, like everybody did, that they had AIDS. And I remember myself, I had to go for an AIDS test. And it was all very worrying, and there were people who were committing suicide because they'd got this positive AIDS test. A friend of mine was hemophiliac, and he was the first English patient with AIDS, as far as I was aware. He's still alive today, right? Still alive today, he didn't die. Anyway, um, I used to believe that the AIDS test was accurate. I used to believe that AIDS existed, right? AIDS doesn't exist. Uh, they were giving, all those people dying in Key West, they, they, they weren't dying of AIDS because AIDS doesn't exist. What I saw them dying of were the symptoms of chemotherapy because they were being given chemotherapy, the cancer drugs. Now they know that the AIDS tests were about 40% inaccurate. 40% inaccurate? So how many people killed themselves? How many, people, how many people's husbands, wives left them or whatever for an inaccurate test? So we believe that the cancer tests are accurate. We believe that when, when we're told we've got cancer, that we've actually got it. Um, they downgraded several cancers uh, last year. What used to be, you've got cancer, has just now, now been downgraded to lesions. How about the people who took the chemotherapy because they were told they had cancer when they didn't? I mean, um, do people die of cancer? No, I, don't, I think they die generally of chemotherapy. So AIDS never existed. All we saw as AIDS was the symptoms of the drugs. And over the last 30 years, they've changed the drugs that they give the, the, the people with HIV, because HIV is a real virus, which can be overcome with, with vitamin C, like, like viruses can be. Um, so we are being so misled. I mean, it's cruel and criminal. So what I suggest is that we have a little break for a drink or something, and uh, then if you want, I'll carry on and give you all the answers rather than just concentrate on the problems. Is that all right? Yeah, thank you. So um, I thought I'd show you like, like a two minute video. Um, do any of you know any people with autism? Okay, all right. So you really need to watch this. It'll just, uh, we won't play the whole thing. We'll play about two minutes.
this is our timeline. February 28th, ketogenic diet. March 1st, Bravo yogurt. In just three days on those two things, we noticed increased eye contact. He was calmer. He would sit quietly for a TV show, which was out of the norm for him. In just one week, he was no longer wetting the bed. His belly bloating was gone. He was sleeping through the night, sitting still for meals, seeking out other activities, playing outside with other kids, and moving through his morning routine with just one verbal prompt. My husband and I were amazed. March 28th, introducing Rerum. The very next day, his speech therapist reported absolutely no need for redirection. He was calm, focused, increased social interaction with other kids, hand flapping was gone, no visual stimming, um, had markedly increased core strength, and will now jump on a trampoline the way a typical child does. So these are the beautiful things we are seeing with our wonderful son. Improved reading skill, new language, generating his own ideas, relaxed and calm, no more bedwetting, improved social interaction, initiating his own responsibilities, and articulation of internal healing. So my mantra for the past nine years has been faith, hope, recovery. I'm adding in the, the knowledge piece, which so it's now faith, hope, knowledge, recovery. Um, recovery is what we're seeing happening before our eyes every day. Each and every day, Ben does something a little bit different, a little bit more typical. Just yesterday, I received a text from my therapy worker that says, Ben's friend asked, where is Heidi? Ben chimed in, yeah, where is Heidi? <laughs> the therapist asked Ben, who is Heidi? And Ben replies, she is my angel. She is my mom. And then the text read on to say, this was the cutest thing I've ever heard him say, and it made me tear up. He is so happy. You get the impression. So that was the ketogenic diet, Bravo and Rerum. So the ketogenic diet is essentially cutting out grains and starchy vegetables and the very sweet fruits. What would you call a starch? Which, can you name a few starchy vegetables? Potatoes. Yeah. Sweet potatoes. Okay. Um, all fruit sweet, really? Well, uh, the berries are the best. Um, things like melon, pineapple tend to be very sweet. Um, but but, but it, 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 it depends what, what you're trying to do. You know, the the, the ketogenic diet is variable depending on what issue one is trying trying to sort sort through. Yeah. Does quinoa fall somewhere good, or is that bad? Well, the problem with both quinoa and amaranth yeah. is that the South Americans, who who it used to be the staple food, can't afford it anymore because the prices have gone up because we're eating it. It's so morally bad. Uh, yeah, some people say that one should avoid quinoa and amaranth as well, and other people say it's fine. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, if you cooked it a lot, yes, because I mean, you know, you know, as you know, one of the things that with with cooking things a long time is they get very sweet. You know, aubergines can get very sweet. You know, anything can get very sweet if you cook it for a long time. So I think uh, the butternut sw squash probably, and again, I'm not really sure, probably if you really cooked it a lot, but it depends what you're trying to do. If, if you're diabetic and you're trying to avoid sweet things, yes, butternut squash cooked too long might be an issue, but in other cases it might not be. Um, so uh, it's important to understand that um, uh, autis autism can generally be overcome my favorite autism story of all time is Kerry Rivera. Kerry Rivera wrote the book Reversing the Symptoms Known as Autism and how she reversed her son's autism. She was, uh, her son was eight by the time she realized that something could be done and so she immediately took him off all grains, all grains, and she took him off all dairy. Now as you probably know, autistic children generally tend to only eat grains and dairy. So after she'd removed grains and dairy from her son's diet, there was only one food left that he could eat, would eat, and that was chips. 
So for 10 days, he ate nothing but French fried potatoes. Obviously, they made them themselves at home. After three days on nothing but chips, he spoke. He hadn't spoken for eight years. So it wasn't that the answer was chips. The thing was the answer was getting him off all grains and all dairy. Right? Who would have thought that on chips, you can cure autism with chips? I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> so, and that was spelled with a K. Um, <laughs> so what happens with autistic children? Well, they, they get heavy metal poisoning. Uh, you know, and the vaccines obviously are a huge part of that. Dr. Jeff Bradstreet, the one that shot himself and jumped off the bridge, he discovered that in Cuba, they have a similar rate of um, vaccinations to here in England or America. But in Cuba, they hardly have any autism at all. And he figured it out. In Cuba, they don't have paracetamol. Right? Paracetamol is one of the triggers uh, and in England, in Europe, in America, the doctors actually advise that you give your baby paracetamol either prior to or at the time of the vaccination because it's going to be painful. And uh, so, not only that, but paracetamol um, is now shown to cut off empathy. People who are taking paracetamol do not feel empathy properly. Really unusual. Have they worked out why? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, you, you see, even the most beneficial of drugs are going to have nasty effects. You know, there are almost no pharmaceutical drugs that have good effects. The only ones I know of that are really positive would include low-dose naltrexone, Low-dose nal naltrexone is very, very interesting. Um, uh, paracetam. Paracetam is uh, a nootropic. Uh, nootropic means brain enhancer. Uh, the first ever brain enhancer, the first ever nootropic, was invented by Al Albert Hoffman, the guy who discovered LSD. And Albert Hoffman was already very famous prior to discovering LSD because he'd made a nootropic uh, called, <laughs> it'll come to me, uh, he, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen. That, this was over 60 years ago. Hydrogen has no side effects, boosts brain function, and um, is still available today. No, this is a nootropic. It's a brain enhancer. How do you spell it? What, nootropic? Hydrogen, H-Y-D-E-R-G-I-N-E. Hydrogen. -E. And, uh, but, but paracetam, pyracetam, paracetam is the one that most people go for if they want to boost their immune system. Uh, sorry, boost their brain function. Did any of you see Limitless, the film Limitless? Yeah. Right? That was based on paracetam. And um, so uh, I was thinking of selling paracetam. As soon as I f ha found out about that, I thought, wow. But of course, like everything good, you can't get it in England. But you can. <laughs> but you can. Um, the, uh, uh, what happens is that people will, will sell it out of Hong Kong. You see, there's so much post coming through Hong Kong that customs can't stop it. You know, because everything you buy on eBay virtually comes from Hong Kong. So um, a lot of these companies will sell it out of Hong Kong because there aren't enough customs to stop it. So uh, I'm not advising anything like this, of course. Um, there are some very interesting products out there, some very interesting products. There's something called aldosterone, like testosterone, aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is a, is a hormone, so it's not freely available, but it is available. And um, if people are losing their hearing, they can use it as an eardrop. Uh, you know, obviously, anything like this, you want professional advice. Um, 
The biggest problem with aldosterone for people with a, that are hard of hearing is they put too many drops in for about three days, everything's too loud. And, but it's not just volume, it's clarity. Um, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people who are hard of hearing, they have problems that say distinguishing one noise when there are lots of noises going on. You know, it's not just about turning up the volume like a hearing aid does, it's about the, the clarity of what they hear. And aldosterone can be very useful from this perspective. Um, Would you have good effects for tinnitus? Not necessarily. Tinnitus has many, many, many causes. And the first thing one's got to assume is it's a deficiency issue. And you know, I basically recommend a, a, a kit f to cope with deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And I reckon if you spend about 120 pounds, you can, generally speaking, overcome most people's health issues, probably. You might want to spend a bit more. But the keys to fixing one's health, I would say, are these. In winter, vitamin D. Now, not everybody's low on vitamin D, but I would suggest in winter 95% of all English people are low on vitamin D because there just isn't enough sun. You know, remember that our ancestors here in England would have been outside a lot, right? They would have been looking after the food and wandering about looking for food. They would have been outside a lot. They would have been barefoot and they're catching lots of sunshine. So we're all vitamin D deficient, almost everybody. And anybody with dark skin they've really got some problems going on. And Birmingham City Hospital for 30 pounds do a vitamin D test through the post. And it's worth take, using, doing that twice, taking it before you supplement, see how low you are, again, particularly in winter, and then supplementing for a month and then doing another test and see whether you're supplementing enough, too little, too much, whatever. Most things you don't need to test, but vitamin D, it's very hard to tell by looking at somebody or asking them questions. But anybody who says whatever their problem is gets worse in winter, you can almost guarantee that it's vitamin D. So people who get sad in winter, people who lack energy in winter, that kind of thing. Yes? I have very, very severe stuff. I've well, only just flipped into summer mode. Right. So you want to be supplementing with vitamin D in winter? Not enough then, not enough. I mean, I, I personally find that I do well in winter taking once a week 50,000 IUs of vitamin D. That is well more than Well, you see, doctors recommend 400. Uh, I gave my doctor, my doctor uh, said he'd got the flu this is many years ago, and I said, take 50,000 IUs of vitamin D all at once. He rings me back two and a half later, two and a half hours later, and says my my flu's gone. I don't think he really had flu; he had man flu. You know, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, vitamin D can be so useful. The the weird thing was it was that same medical doctor who told me ten years ago that I should be taking vitamin D. Mm. I used to get colds and flus every year, two or three times. As soon as I started taking vitamin D, I haven't had a cold or flu or a cough uh, in ten years because that was it. You know, if you've got enough vitamin C, you've got enough zinc, you've got enough vitamin D, the chances are you're not going to get a cold. Very probably. Is echinacea? That works for me. Yep. Echinacea is very good. Um, but again, if you, you, know, you shouldn't need the echinacea. You know, there's a basic deficiency of either vitamin D or vitamin C or zinc or something. And probably the echinacea is providing one of those. But really, it's a dietary issue. Uh, that's very interesting. Because my daughter and I have found from experience that the very old fashioned traditional way to use a remedy for elderflower, one of the colds and things, works. But, from what you're saying, it must be elderflower, must be providing. Zinc or Probably the vitamin C, I would think, maybe. Elderflower tea. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, your vitamins tend to be destroyed a bit by heat, whereas minerals are resistant to heat. So um, let me show you a couple of things which I think you might find interesting. 
that the, the very first material that I ever put into a bottle was something called fulvic minerals. Uh, how many of you know about fulvic? Four of you. Five of you. Okay. So for those who don't know, fulvic minerals occur naturally in the soil everywhere. Yeah, we dig under this building, there will be fulvic and humic minerals in the soil underneath. And because they've destroyed the soils with modern agriculture, basically these fulvic minerals are what we're all missing. It's what should be in food and isn't. So 100 years ago, this would have been totally unnecessary. Nobody would have needed this because we'd be eating these materials all the time. So for myself, I was researching um, the survivors of cancer some years ago. What, I wanted to know what they did right. Why was it that they survived when 97% of people seemed to die? And I was studying what the Chinese were doing. And I read about this material from the Chinese literature. They were using fulvic minerals a lot. And the results that I was reading about were almost unbelievably good. So I started sending off for fulvic minerals from suppliers around the world. And generally what arrived were big bottles. And I used to try it and I felt nothing. And I sent off for another bottle, I felt nothing and so on. Then one day a bottle a bit smaller than this turned up. And I tried it and the next morning, literally, I felt fabulous. I felt like 10 years had dropped off my body. You know, I was feeling my age, you might say. But the day after I'd taken this, my body felt so nice to be in. It, it was weird. And I, I'd n never experienced anything like that before or since, actually. Anyway, so I was so impressed, I went out and bought gallons of the stuff and gave it to all my clients and all my friends. And the first time the phone rang was three days later. And this girl I knew, who was three months pregnant, rang me up. And she said, you know the morning sickness that I was getting, it has stopped. Now, I'm not saying this is the cure for morning sickness, because it's not. But it was for her. It was for her. You know, when people are pregnant, they, some of them crave pickled onions, or they want to eat coal, or they want to eat soil, or whatever it is. And this is simple. Their bodies know at a very core level what they need. And coal, for instance, is full of minerals. You Not fancy a bit of coal? Oh, yeah. right. well, I had to have cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Week 25. What minerals in But in, in the first trimester, apricots, of course, tomatoes. So, you know, our bodies are so... Oh, okay. So, our subconscious is so incredible. I mean, it really is incredible. You get a craving for something, chances are that's exactly what you need. It may not be, it may be cheesecake, but uh, generally speaking, so, um, for anyone, they should assume that they're going to be low on the nutrients. You just might as well assume it these days. So by investing a bit of money in yourself and trying at least for a month to get every single nutrient and do a bit of a basic detox at the same time, you might be very surprised about how you feel. A lot of people that I say come off grains tell me they feel absolutely amazing and haven't felt that energetic for 20 years. You know, the grains are really damaging people much more than, more than they realise. But the problem is that most people are addicted to the grains. I mean, really addicted. All of them. Rice, barley, rye. Uh, no, not pulses necessarily. Not pulses necessarily. But the ketogenic diet would, wouldn't have you eat too many pulses. However... Um, Um, sorry, I lost where I was going with that. Sorry, no, no, no. Just thought, um, you were saying for a month, try and make sure yeah. you get the nutrients and do a bit of a detox. Yes. And then you start in detail. Okay. So, 
what you need is the fulvic minerals, which gives you at least 70 of the trace elements. Now, you might have a good multi-mineral. And a multi-mineral uh, might have uh, maybe 20 things. It might have zinc and selenium and all the good stuff. But most of them don't have the trace elements in. And th th this is an incredible supplement that I take myself. But this is a multi-nutrient made by Dr. Mercola, and it's um, all natural. It's got such an ingredients list you wouldn't believe. But you've got to take eight of these a day. All right, eight. Any multi-nutrient that really doesn't have eight in it probably isn't enough. And I know it's a lot, but you want to be really well, really, really well. This is the sort of level you've got to go to to be really well. Now, this one, this is super important. This is iodine. Now, uh, there are various types of iodine out there. This one is called Lugols, L-U-G-O-L-S, invented by Professor Lugol about 100 years ago. And this is pure elemental iodine and potassium iodide. Potassium iodide is what they give the troops when they go into an atomic area, nuclear radiation. So, do we have to worry about nuclear radiation? Oh, yes, we do, unfortunately. There is radioactive iodine from Fukushima and Sellafield and all the rest of them floating around right now. But do you have to be worried about radiation? No. If you have all the nutrients you need, particularly iodine, there is nowhere for radiation to go. If your iodine receptors are full of iodine, the radioactive stuff has no home. It just floats on by. So what happens if a woman is low on iodine and they're pregnant? Well, the, the child will be born with a low IQ. If the woman is chronically low on iodine, there's a medical term for that, the child will be born a cretin. You know, mentally deficient. So if you want a high IQ for your child, you want to make sure you've got enough iodine in you. And if, you're, if you are you, you want to make sure you've got enough iodine in you. Um, how many people walk into a room and forget why they walked in? Okay. All right, that's virtually everybody. Um, in two months, three months from now, that won't happen anymore. You'll walk into a room and, f and remember why you walked in. How many people, um, if they didn't have a special place, would forget where their car keys are? A few. Okay. Um, this iodine lifts brain fog. There are many people who recognize the term brain fog. And you need to take it for two or three months, and you need to take the right amount, but you'll get your brain back. How do you spell the Lugols? L-U-G-O-L-S. I take sea kelp yeah. because I'm told that that contains iodine. It does. But is this more potent than that? Way more. Right. Yeah. If you want to take a meaningful dose of kelp, really, you, you're probably talking about six tablespoonfuls of it. It's right. just. But okay. also, that has potassium iodide, which takes the radiation out, where a sea kelp tablet goes. Right? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, so, okay. Let's look at the symptoms of iodine. Uh, sorry, let's look at the symptoms of fluoride poisoning. They are identical to a deficiency of iodine. Uh, so let, let's explain the halides. The halides are iodine, which is the good guy, and then the bad guys, chlorine, bromine, fluoride. Okay? Um, those last three are a smaller atomic size than, thi than iodine. So, so it, if you've got fluoride, bromine, or chlorine, they get in where the iodine ought to be and displace the iodine. So uh, let me put this in clearer perspective. In Japan, less than 10% of women at menopause report hot flushes. In England, over 90% of women at menopause report hot flushes. Japanese women hardly ever get breast cancer. English women do. It's the iodine. They're eating so much seaweed 
and so much fish, they get all the iodine they could possibly want, and they hardly have any thyroid problems. Thyroid problems are epidemic in England right now. It's because of the chlorine, the bromine, and the fluoride. So if you're using fluoride toothpaste, throw it away. Um, don't use it because fluoride is a desperately dangerous neurotoxin and you don't want it. What about the swimming pool? You don't want, you don't want to swim in a swimming pool. If you did, you'd want to take a lot of iodine before you did it to make sure your iodine receptors were as full as possible. Um, I'm afraid, you know, we're being poisoned. We are being poisoned and Chlorine is very, very dangerous. Bromine in flower improver is dangerous and fluoride is very dangerous. And the problem is if you're in a city, then you've really got to worry because, well, not worry, you've got to be, you've got to be aware. In the city, if you're drinking recycled sewage water, if you're bathing in recycled sewage water, you are getting everybody's Viagra, Prozac, antibiotics, birth control, you name it. And every time it goes round, the sewage works, it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and most people are poisoned with secondhand drugs. It's a real issue. So how are you going to deal with your water? The cheapest way is to buy an ozone generator. 20 quid on eBay or somewhere, you can buy an ozone generator. Now you have to be careful because you don't want to breathe too much ozone because it's irritating to the lungs, but you can bubble ozone through water for a minute and completely neutralize all the chemicals in it with the exception of fluoride. Fluoride you have to deal with differently. How you deal with fluoride is with something called borax. Borax contains the mineral boron and borax, our ancestors knew borax, they added it in their washing uh, to, to, to clean things. Now, borax, if you put a pinch in a liter of water, or a teaspoonful in the bath, it will neutralize fluoride. Now, borax is very interesting indeed, or boron is very interesting indeed. The country with the highest arthritis rate on the planet is Jamaica, and even the dogs limp in Jamaica, apparently. And the reason is that they planted sugar, sugarcane all over the island. Sugarcane stripped the mineral boron from the soil and then when they started making sugar beet, they took out a lot of the farming areas that had the sugar cane planted food. And because there was no boron in the soil, everybody got arthritis. The country with the lowest arthritis in the world is Israel, who, surprise, surprise, have the highest rate of boron in the soil. So is there a link? Well, there clearly is. So boron's very important. In a good multi-mineral, you'd get it. So, sorry, um, if after you've just d done distill of your water, if you've got a distiller at home, um, would it benefit them to, to you'd be okay so, to add borax or boron or the trace minerals, the fulvic minerals? Well, um, if you're drinking distilled water, there are two schools of thought about that. There is, yeah. This is why I'm not... Do I, don't I? If... While drinking distilled water short-term can, I think, be very beneficial, long-term, I'm not happy with it. And if I were drinking distilled water, I'd be adding salt, Celtic salt, unprocessed grey, damp sea salt to the water. Uh, Celtic grey. Celtic. Or, and or, a, cup, a drop or two of the fulvic minerals. Um, you know, the problem with distilled water is it's dead yeah. and empty and because water is the ultimate solvent if you're going to drink distilled water it has to pull some minerals out with it because that's what water does yeah. um, so I'm, I'm not terribly happy about drinking distilled water without doing something to put the life back in it again um, so the, the, the ozone generator is an incredibly useful thing you can ozonate your bath for instance, if you wanted to, you can ozonate vegetables. So let's say you're, you can't get the organic vegetables you might want and you've got some strawberries or some lettuce or something which is sprayed with chemicals. If you put that in a bowl of water and bubble ozone through it, the ozone will neutralize uh, pretty much <coughs> all of the chemicals that, 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 that are on the surface of the vegetables. 
if a minute maybe um, if you had fish or meat and you were concerned that there might be some worms or parasites in it again put that in a bowl of water bubble ozone through it and again now you now you, you'll have killed all the parasites so if I was traveling abroad for instance or somewhere like Birmingham where I don't like the water that much I would take an ozone generator with me uh, you might want to filter the stuff out as well uh, but, you know, two different types of water. Regular water that's come from a nice source and then recycled sewage. If you're getting recycled sewage, you, you are risking your health in, in a serious way. So, ozone generator. There's a lot of chlorine coming off Bristol tap water at the moment. So, if you ozonate it, that'll stop it. Uh, if you're running a bath, by the way, if you run it with hot water, you adjust your boiler, you know, if you've got a tank, yeah, that, when, when, it, when a, a hot water tank scales up, it captures the chlorine in the scale. So if you, if you run your bath, bath water purely with hot water, you, it won't smell of chlorine. If you add cold water, then it will smell of chlorine. So let's say you have now a bath full of chlorine water and you want to do something about it, get some vitamin C, ascorbic acid, put a teaspoonful of vitamin C in the water, it neutralizes the chlorine. So, uh, let me get back to iodine and tell you the symptoms of uh, a deficiency of iodine. The symptoms are, apart from forgetting why you walk in a room, often people get dry elbows. Can I ask you, how many of you have got dry skin, even the tiniest little bit on your elbows? Can you put your hand up if you've got dry skin on your elbows? I think we're actually out no? Okay, well, uh, it's the thyroid, yeah, and, and it's specifically a, a lack of iodine. Other symptoms of lack of iodine will be cold hands and feet, uh, thinning eyebrows at the edges, dry skin. Um, so, uh, I would recommend if you want to supplement with iodine that you learn how to use it properly. There's a video called The Iodine Crisis, which explains it very well. Um, in the old days, if, if, if somebody came to the doctor and the doctor had no idea how to cure them, they'd give iodine. That, that was the, uh, a, a general cure-all. And uh, you see, iodine can raise temperature. If you've got a thyroid problem, which most people do, your temperature runs low. And if your temperature runs low, your immune system doesn't work properly. So. Uh, so what I recommend for good health, a really good multi-mineral, fulvic minerals, magnesium, iodine, and Celtic salt. Now, uh, somebody sprayed on uh, some iodine on their shoulder earlier, or the back of the neck. What happened? I still have it, but it's, it has um, improved. How, what percent, how much did it improve by, would you think? I'd say it's improved. <coughs> About 20, 30%. Okay, so try it again and tell us in a few minutes if it's improved it more. Okay, so uh, if I can do a shameless bit of plugging, if anybody needs uh, any of the supplements that uh, I've mentioned, if they come up and talk to me afterwards and I can tell them how, how to get them. Um, I've just teamed up with, uh, I, I work with several health practitioners and medical doctors around the world, and I've just teamed up with a German guy out in Mallorca who has an incredible clinic. And uh, he recently had a professional cyclist in, and um, he deals with a lot of famous sports people. And the cyclist, like his clients, had 10 sessions with him over a 10-day <coughs> period. And these sessions involve using advanced oxygen techniques because we're all incredibly low on oxygen. And uh, this guy, he was running between 180th in the world as a professional cyclist to 150th in the world. After 10 treatments, he did five stages in the top 10 in a row. So um, you see the oxygen thing. I mentioned earlier how a, a normal cell becomes cancerous if you deprive it of oxygen. We are deprived of oxygen. 
a few hundred years ago, and they know this from measuring oxygen trapped in amber and things, there was about 40% oxygen in the, in, in the world. Then they cut down all the trees, you know, 99% of the English trees are gone. So we're now down to about 20%, 19% oxygen, something like that in the world, depending on how humid it is. The more humid, the less oxygen. So um, uh, <coughs> if you can get more oxygen into your body, are you going to be fitter, stronger, healthier? Yes, you are. Um, do any of you know about the Iceman? Yeah. Um, Hoff. Yeah. <laughs> Wim Hof. So if, if any of you don't know about Wim Hof, um, most people can hold their breath for what, 30 seconds or something like that? You do three minutes of Wim Hof's breathing technique, which is very simple. It's hyperventilation. You just <laughs> like that. 30 repetitions of that, preferably sitting down. And let's say you can hold your breath for 30 seconds. You, you breathe like that, you'll be able to hold your breath for double. Let's say you can do 10 press-ups. Without breathing, you'll now be able to do 20 press-ups. You can get so much oxygen into your bloodstream in three minutes that you can hold your breath for twice as long, do twice as much exercise, without breathing, because we can supercharge ourselves with oxygen, which is how we're meant to be. We're meant to be stronger than we are. Right? Check out Wim Hof. Unbelievable. He, he teaches how to do it, and there are lots of, lots of the instructions on the video, some of, some of the basic breathing techniques. Um, he can do things like um, be naked. At, well, he's climbed Everest in shorts, right? Because once you, once you realize what you can do by breathing, uh, you're not affected by, by cold in the way that you used to be. You know, it, uh, he's, he's climbed into um, chambers of ice uh, for long periods of time. He did, and he did a marathon in his shorts in the, in the middle of the Antarctic, where he'd never done a marathon before, and he just did it. Yeah, and yeah. He the bottom of a canal as well, in a freezing. There's a program on it. There have been lots of programs on Wim Hof. I mean, just, just incredible. And he's waking so many people up to the fact we are much more than we think. You know, let me give you a few other examples about how we're more than we think. I don't know whether you know about the fMRI scanner work that they've done. What, what they did was they got ill people in hospital and using an fMRI scanner, you can see brain function in real time. You can see thoughts as they're happening. So they said, let's say, imagine there's a woman in hospital in Bristol. She's in the MRI scanner, so looking at her brain function. They say to her mum, who's in Canada, think healing thoughts to your daughter now, and the brain lights up. So they've proven that your thoughts have absolutely real effect on people that you know. So if you're thinking nasty thoughts towards something, they will be affecting the person receiving it. If you're thinking nice thoughts, they will be affected by it. Okay? So they took the same MRI scanner and did a different experiment. They got a random number generator to generate pictures, two types of pictures. One type of picture was like a flower, something lovely. The other type of picture was like a car crash, something not lovely. Each time the brain was exposed to either image, it reacted the same. It didn't matter that the brain had already seen the car crash 10 times already. That didn't seem to make any difference. So what happened was that they had the random number generator set up to generate either the happy image or the unhappy image. Five, sorry, four seconds prior to the random number generator deciding which image to show, the brain lit up if it was the car crash, right? In other words, the brain had four seconds advance warning that there was a car crash coming. That's because of the morphic fields. Be. So, and the time varied depending on what was going on. How many of you have had time slow down? Any of you had time slow down? Yeah. yeah. 
So a third of you. Yeah? yeah I remember I've uh, funny enough BBC of all people, but they did a program once yes. um, on seven seconds before it existed and um, nothing online comes still. So people would seem to know what's going to happen seven seconds. Yeah, it depends on the seriousness, it turns out, as to how, how long you have in advance. And uh, you know, for those who've had time slow down, they're all, yeah. It, it's clear that we are totally connected to everything, and you know, we, we can pick up on whatever we choose to pick up on, um, essentially. Uh, so, uh, if any of you want to buy any of the supplements that I've got, I've got a huge pile of them. If any of you um, want to have a personal consultation, I like to spend an hour or two with people. And generally speaking, I can get to the bottom of, of most people's issues, generally speaking. Uh, if you want to come to Mallorca and experience the rejuvenation techniques we've got going over there, we've got everything from stem cells to um, these oxygen treatments. Uh, they're not for the poor. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I also put on longer courses, uh, day, day courses, where I teach things like uh, self-hypnosis and uh, the sort of thing we're doing now, but in much more depth. Uh, you've been on one, Kai. What did you think? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I've done a whole weekend in your house. And, yeah, so that's one of the best things I've ever done. What, was that the weekend when David Noakes was there? Yeah, when he was actually speaking, yeah. yeah. So I was there that weekend. I uh, purchased the pain genie. Like, oh, we had no vitamins and minerals anyway. So. And t tell people how you got on with the pain genie, for instance. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I don't need to use it, so not now. <laughs> so I had a lot of problems with my knee. Being a builder, I had a lot of problems with my knees, my back, um, neck. The neck would grind in the jaw. You know, a lot of things that you taught me as well. Um, but uh, yeah, all that's gone now. Oh, cool. just, just playing about with it, not really knowing the exact science, but just using my intuition where the pain was, what I had to set it and you can feel it. Right, very good. Uh, any questions anybody's got? Yeah. Do you think it would be beneficial for me to speak to you about my wife, Sara, who, um, I'll just tell you a quick, quick story. Um, she took 42, and at the age of 18, she went on holiday with friends, and got bit by a tick, which uh, caused Lyme's disease. Um, I know she has MS. And there is a, I've heard there is a connection with that. Um, the gentleman who found the carpet warehouse, his son is really ill due to a tick. Um, uh, neurologically, again, a problem. And he's bed bound, he's been bed bound for about 10, well, really 10 years. Wow. Um, and yeah, so Sara is, um, she hasn't deteriorated because I've listened to my brother who knows a lot about what you, you know, you've been talking about. But, um, is she still walking? She's still walking, but um, aided slightly, you know, yeah. But, uh, Was she a person who tried to stay out of the sunshine? Not really. Um, I would say um, you hit on one of the notes about drinking water. She never drank any water, ever. You know, just really, you know, um, I think her father is the same, doesn't drink any water, but she does now, obviously. But uh, yeah, um, you know, there is a big connect We think there's a big connection with that tick, which causes Lyme disease. And did she actually see the tick? Uh, well, do, is she sure there was a tick? Yes, because I think when, when she, she went to the hospital, they actually said it's, it's, a, it's a tick bite which caused the Lyme disease because a stray dog went into her bed in Greece, um, slept in her bed while they, they, they weren't aware, and the next morning, um, you know, all the symptoms were there of Lyme disease. And, oh, I see, okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, there are a number of things that can be done about Lyme. One of the ones that's having huge effect with Lyme actually is the rarum. Um, but it's something that one would need a, a really long, well, a, a decent consultation with to ask her a whole load of questions to find out. I wouldn't want to give any false hope, but a lot of people are getting recovery from Lyme. With MS, um, of course, 
it, she may have symptoms similar to that. Doesn't mean she's got MS. Um, you know, MS and Parkinson's are very difficult once people are in the wheelchair, and even more difficult once they're lying in bed. But when they're still standing, there's usually uh, quite a lot of hope. Um, so yeah, I'll be. Deteriorated for, for like ten years. You know, she'd been stable. Oh well, that's good. Yeah, and um, yeah. So, so I, mean, I, I, I would be looking at heavy metal poisoning and and trying to get heavy metals out uh, as one thing. Might do a hair mineral analysis to see what's going on there. You know, a number of things that could be done. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I'm trying to detox my thumb at the moment. Uh, vaccine damage. Um, so the heavy metal. Um, what is it? Um, just really nice and fast. Um, I'm not sure how to go about it. Okay, what, I've started what, already. What have you tried so far? So I'm doing the gentle uh, bentonite clay, um, baths with uh, coriander oil, frankincense, and crossing. Um, I've stopped using, you know, I've got distiller now. Um, Use an organic one possible. Uh, I don't really know anything uh, much more. Chlorella? Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I forgot to mention chlorella. Um, and something else. Sorry, it's kind of mixed up with coriander. It's very difficult to get the chlorella into him. He, <coughs> he's minimally on the spectrum, I would say, as his mother, and watching him. Um, so he's very choosy about what he puts into his mouth, doesn't like the textures, doesn't like lots of food, he'll only drink water, um, and he's very sensitive to any changes within the water. He's very perceptive of it, so um, trying to get chlorella into him is very difficult. Okay, and is he addicted to grains? Uh, yeah, he likes rice. Okay, uh, try, try him on black rice. Thank you. Uh, black rice isn't wild rice. Black rice is a whole different thing in completely. Children like it because when you boil it, it goes purple. Um, black rice is, is very healthy. You could try them on that. Um, I'd recommend you watch Kerry, Kerry Rivera. Yeah. Um, and her protocol is quite difficult. But uh, Autism One, that there's... Uh, conferences called Autism One every year. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if any of you watch Autism One on YouTube, you'll learn everything you possibly need to know about autism. All the answers are there. Thank you very much. And any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> not, with, not with respect to me, can you do anything about somebody who's got really significant fat that isn't that, didn't used to be natural fat? Well, you see, why would the body hold extra fat? Well, if, you, if you've got a toxic load, and it could be from shampoo, it could be from food, it could be from whatever, and the body can't get rid of those toxins, where, where, where is it going to put them? Well, it wouldn't want it on the brain, wouldn't want the toxins in the heart or the essential organs. So where's left? Well, there's the bones, probably wouldn't want them there. So the body parks toxins in fat. Doesn't it poo them away? Well, you see, many of the toxins we're, we're getting now are chemicals which the body doesn't know how to get rid of. Uh, you know, we've got them in. It, it's got no mechanism to get them out. So it's got no choice but to store them in fat. So uh, when people do a detox, quite often the fat goes. But you've got to be clever doing a detox. So you don't want to get rid of the fat and then release those toxins back into the bloodstream again. You'll feel ill. So I would say that's probably one of the big reasons why people are carrying too much weight. The other one is, going back to the beginning of where we started, that they've changed grains so much that they are making people fat now. No, I mean, there's no question that the ketogenic diet, where people come off all grains and all starchy carbohydrates, they lose weight like nobody's business. You know, and I mean, it didn't used to, you know, you look at a, picture of a high street, Bristol High Street, so to speak, 40, 50 years ago, there were no fat people. You know, in the Victorian times, the, at, at the circus, 
the, 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 the freak would be the fat woman, who now we'd consider isn't that bad. So, uh, yeah, we're doing Do you think the body's generating fat in order to set, store toxins? Yeah, safely to set. You, the body would never do anything wrong. You know, the doctors are taught, your body goes wrong. You're a clever doctor, you can do something about it. I don't believe for one second your body ever goes wrong. Your body just adapts to a circumstance. Uh, I mean, look, look at quite a few cancerous tumours, for instance. Uh, very often, uh, you see this with breast cancer, if the, if the person lives long enough, the cancer breaks through the surface of the breast and it will actually drop out. The body, the body does whatever it can to expel toxins. It will either lock them up or it will try to expel them. And you see, the problem is that doctors do biopsies. A tumour has about seven protective layers around it. It's encapsulated. But if a doctor shoves a sharp biopsy needle in there, goes through all the seven layers and releases the cancer into the bloodstream and metastasizes it. You know, unfortunately, many of the medical procedures, which are just normal, are massively dangerous. Having a biopsy is a terribly okay. stupid thing to do. I'm afraid it is. So uh, in terms of getting a consultation with you, do you, are you contacting me through? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, my website is clivedecarl.com and you can Skype me, Clive Decarl, or you can email me, clive at clivedecarl.com, or you can phone me, which is 01672. Five six four eight zero four, but I'll give you all my cards. Yeah. I, uh, so perhaps you could pass pass you those around. Um, so a few other things I've got with me. Uh, this is colloidal silver. These are amino acids. If you wanted to, if you had somebody who was very ill and they just couldn't eat, you know, they just can't bring themselves to eat, how do muscle builders build muscle? Well, they eat protein. So if somebody can't eat the protein, they're just too weak, they can't manage it, but they can take some capsules, you can give them uh, MAP, amino acid capsules, and you can get pe people who would have died from starvation can come back to life with this. Also, if you, if you wanted to detox your liver and kidneys, if you stopped eating protein for a while on the ketogenic diet and took amino acids instead, you can literally detox your kidneys and liver by giving them a pure rest because without eating lots of protein, they haven't got much to do. So... Did you tell me about colloidal silver? Surely it's dangerous to eat uh, Well, you see, um, silver is... Uh, a mineral which we have to have. People don't realise that, you know, I mean, you, you, all the, what, what, what are the minerals? Well, you've got copper, you've got zinc, they're all metals, potassium, magnesium, they're all metals. And you know, just, just to put minerals in perspective, let's say you've got some potassium, a lump of potassium, bear in mind that we're mainly water. You get a lump of potassium, you throw it in a bucket of water, it'll explode in flames. You take a lump of sodium, we're mainly water, you throw it in a bucket of water, it explodes in flames. Magnesium burns with a bright light. You know, we're dealing with very, very powerful things, minerals. You know, you add minerals to your body and explosive things can happen. And... Uh, so silver is a very important trace element. If you're low on silver, you'll get infections. You know, the ancient Greeks knew all about silver. You know, one of the reasons the ancient Greeks conquered half the world was they understood silver. They understood that if they got wounded in battle, if they put some powdered silver in the wound, there would be no infection. And the burns units in modern hospitals know that. They put silver on burns, stops infections. Silver is amazing. So, yeah, so, so I, um, I, I've, got, I've got my generator at home, so I make my own colloidal silver. Um, but I do worry about consuming too much. So I'm going to stick to it when 
um, I can feel myself getting ill, or I can sense that my son's coming down with an infection or virus, um, and normally just kind of like use it for sort of two to three days. I just literally put a, a capful in his water uh, in the morning, um, and you know, we drink that throughout the day. Um, can I? Is that okay, or is that too if much? You're, no. If you're making 10 parts per million yeah. colloidal silver and assuming that you're, you've got a diet which does involve some probiotic foods, you know. Yeah. Well, I give people probiotics. Okay. So, so then you should be all right. I've had people in hospital ring me up and say, they, I need an operation. They can't do the operation because I've got an infection. I've sent them in a litre and a half of colloidal silver, 10 parts per million, because it looks like water, so the hospital yeah. doesn't complain. They've drunk a litre and a half or even two litres, and I've had several people ring me up and say, not only has the infection gone, but they told me I don't need the operation. I've had so many people with cats and dogs who said, well, the vet said that it would have to be put down. I gave it colloidal silver in the water, it lapped it up and is, uh, and is fine now. I worry about, is it the uh, Argyria? Argyria? The, the, the turning grey thing. Yeah. Right, that would happen if you didn't use distilled water. Okay. If you're using distilled water, then uh, you haven't got the nitrates that are in the water, because silver nitrate is what they used to make uh, black and white photographic paper with. So if you made colloidal silver with tap water, yes, you could get Argyria and turn grey. But it doesn't happen if you make it properly. So I could essentially just have this, I could have it every day. You could do, I'd, you wouldn't necessarily want to, yeah, but right. one of the mistakes people make is not using enough when they need it. Okay. Same with vitamin C. If, if you've got a serious infection, whereas if you are well, one gram, two grams, three grams, or just citrus fruit or lots of vegetables might do it, if you're ill, you might need 10 grams, 20 grams, 100 grams. You know. I find when I try to do a high dose of vitamin C like that, it actually upsets my stomach. Uh, well, then you're taking too much at one time. Now, because everybody's going home, I suggest we stop at this point, and you'll all definitely want to buy magnesium, iodine, fulvic minerals, and everything else I've got. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs>